Okay, well, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We just had met February 25th, two weeks ago, but it feels like we live in a different world right now, doesn't it, with this coronavirus? So, just an update is I was in contact with the first select woman, and you know, we'll all work through this together. Uh, a plan is going to be developed to have systems in place for future meetings. So they're gonna to get together tomorrow, a newsletter will go out, she'll contact most likely me, and then I'll get a hold of, of our board. I mean, there's a, the object here is to take the necessary precautions, but still meet our obligations to the taxpayer, and to the townspeople, so we'll figure out that right balance. So what does that look like? We don't know right now, but we'll know by the end of the week. Um, you know, right now we have a meeting scheduled for 316, 318, and 319. Uh, 316 is at Osborne Hill, at least schedule, right? So what that looks like, if that takes place, or it, does it take place in another building? I mean, these are all questions we all have, but we don't have the answers right now. You know, the one meeting that the Board of Finance has every year is the public hearing meeting and generally it's at one of the high schools to spend at Fairfield Ludlow, I think over the past few years anyway. That meeting's on 328. So that meeting is in, in doubt. I mean, the format is we're up on stage and people come in and they express their comments over the budget, which we will have from the uh, Board of Selectmen by then, and it's before we vote. It gives them an opportunity to express their opinion so not sure how that's going to work. I, I did talk to our town attorney today, and it's one of the things we have to work through. So before we get started with th this meeting, do we have any questions or comments on what I just stated from our board? No? Okay. So then we'll get on with our regular meeting. Um, let me put this resolution before us, and then we have I guess the majority of our building committee here, so thank you for being here, Mr. Quinn. Uh, but we'll begin with getting this motion on the table. So, to hear, consider, and act upon the following bond resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen, entitled a resolution amending and restating the resolution entitled a resolution appropriating $22,600,000 for, for the cost associated with the renovation and expansion of Mill Hill Elementary School and authorizing the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation to increase the amount of the appropriation and this bond authorization by $1,274,000 $274,900 to a total of $23,275,500, consisting of four pages, a copy of which is attached here too. So, so can I have a motion to put this on the Mr. Testani, seconded by Mr. DeWitt. So this motion is now before us, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Quinn, and thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is quickly run through the four pages. Is it, is it on? Oh, <clears throat> okay. They made it a little more difficult. I you. see that, yes. Okay. okay. I got to do two things at one time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, of the four pages, uh, I'd like uh, the group up here uh, to go through them with you very quickly. Uh, Mr. Stein, Dave Stein. Good evening. My name is David Stein. I'm a principal with Silver Petroselli and Associates. We're the architects and engineers on the project. So um, as you know, when we began the initial process, we were working in the schematic phase portion. And essentially what we do at that point is we are we are looking at the overall square footage of building, we're defining the volume of it, we're looking at the overall scope. 
and then we're also putting together cost per square foot numbers and then comparing that not only to industry standard but also to projects that you've recently completed in town to essentially develop that number. As we move into the design development stage, that's when we begin to assemble the entire set of plans and start our due diligence of looking at items such as drilling into the soils, start completing our asbestos abatement, uh, testing, and really start understanding the overall details of the system. Now during schematic design, we put some contingencies in place. We call it design to contingencies to cover any of those normal gaps and then have sort of a buffer that's in place. But as we got into the design development and we all put together and reconciled an estimate, we knew we were over budget. And from that point, we began to look at other scope items that you have in front of you in which we were able to bring that project down and reduce the cost significantly. So there was about six items that we identified that we knew that we could begin to value engineer is essentially the term. One is to eliminate a steam classroom. This was really an additional classroom. Right now they're able to sort of support that within the existing program what's there. We added that to our scope during schematic as an anticipation that we could have this additional space, but we knew that we were able to make that compromise and remove that from the scope of work. We also looked at the paving. We were initially planning to pave the entire area. Um, but we went back to that and decided that we, instead of doing a full depth of pavement replacement, we can just sort of mill the surface and keep a majority of that substructure in place. We evaluated our landscaping design and essentially knew that we could reduce some of the overall landscaping. Um, we looked at also the undergrab sanitary. Um, during the schematic design, we were planning to just remove all of the sanitary. Um, and then we went back to it and said, we're only going to remove the essential pieces. So we were able to reduce about $75,000 of the estimate there. There was some reduction in terms of our rooftop curbing. We were planning a fairly sophisticated curb design. And then we sort of simplified that and saved a considerable amount of money there. And then lastly, in terms of the escalation, we looked at where we are positioned now and our plan to go out to bid with in the next two months, we were able to reduce the overall contingency piece of the estimate projection or escalation contingency and then reductions in the soft cost. And Mark could talk a little bit about that. But essentially, that's what got us to a point to be able to save a considerable amount of money and then bring the project still back close enough for a, um, the request that we're asking for tonight. One of the things you need to bear in mind, all this was done before the coronavirus hit. Okay, we don't know what impact this is going to have on the numbers going forward. Uh, you know, this is all done in, in real time a month ago. Sorry about that. Mr. Chairman, can I ask what? So yes. what are you, give us some perspective on how is the coronavirus, are we talking timing, delays, if schools uh, closed, extended? We're talking about costs. Okay, related to what? Of, related to raw materials. I mean, we get a lot of our stuff from China, for example. I see, okay. Okay, and so to the degree they, they fall short, okay, we'll have to replace that. And, but it's usually by higher costing item countries. So what's our timing on getting those costs? I mean, I know it's uh, uh, evolving as we speak, but. Uh, well, uh, when we go out to bid, we'll get them. As soon as we get the approval for everything, we will go to bid. And then we'll have a pretty good idea what the market is right now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walsh. So you, what are you saying? You might be coming back to us for a further no amount based no. on the coronavirus. Is no, that what I'm you're just saying? saying th these numbers were put together prior to the coronavirus. Okay, but if you say that costs could go up because of the coronavirus and what's going on in China. Mm -hmm that you we, might we, have to come back to us again? No. No. What I'm saying to you, that was just to lay down the, the how the world is today. We are carrying 1.2 million in a contingency. Okay? And that contingency will, 
we believe suffice to take care of the, those cost escalators. Okay. Explain to me briefly that you have two contingencies, right? You have a design contingency and then you have a, a build contingency? Oh, owner contingency, yes. So the, what is the design contingency that was put in your budget when we approved it? It was, uh, Mark, you got that number? So I think it was 835000 So just, yeah, just conceptually, when we are um, who well, no, working. I still got a question. So you $835,000 design contingency, correct? Correct, eight hundred thousand of design contingency. Eight hundred, which is essentially five percent. Okay, and the the build contingency, the the construction 1. contingency, 1.2? 1. 1. 1.26. All right, Mr. Bateson. Yeah, a couple things. I want to follow up with David. Uh, in your value engineering, the first thing you mentioned, I thought I heard eliminate a classroom. Correct. That's a, that's a STEAM or a science, technology, engineering, arts, and math classroom. Is that a full-size classroom? It was slightly smaller than a full-size classroom, but in all intents and purposes, it was a, it was a full-size classroom. We reduced about 700 square feet. And is the principal of Mill Hill here? Yes. You have no problem with that? You fought really hard for the size of that building you wanted. Now we have no problem losing a classroom. That was never in the ed spec. Yeah, that's a, my, that was going to be my question. I don't think that was in the ed spec from my, from my memory. That's so correct. So can you explain <laughs> to me how this STEAM classroom got into your design when it wasn't in the ed spec? How are you guys designing something that's not in the ed spec? Well, we did. We, we put that in. We didn't know what the numbers were going to be. But we do know we have STEAM classes being held. So we wanted to find out how much it would cost. So uh, I'm, put sorry, it I'm sorry, Jim. I'm with you. Fundamentally, I have a problem with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand how you as a building committee goes off and starts designing things that are not in the ed spec. So you can design a pool there if you wanted to. That's not true. But go on. Okay. Why couldn't you? Because you're 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 designing classrooms that are not in the ed spec. Uh, Kevin Chase, Principal Mill Hill. So I think the the thinking behind the addition there was initially when the ed spec was provided, that program did not exist for all K five. It was in existence as a very new program for grades three through five. It was expanded to K to two. It is now considered a, a full program special. So the thought behind that was just as art, PE, music have their own spaces, that this should have its own space as well. Um, but in taking into consideration the fact and speaking with the superintendent that other schools don't have this such classroom, um, uh, it was a reasonable um, deduction. This, this is the confusion I have with these projects is, is that you come to us with an ed spec, you tell us you're going to build to the ed spec, and then other things get added in so that the taxpayer really doesn't get, if there's some savings, the taxpayer doesn't get to save the money. You guys have the ability to go and spend that on additional spaces and additional programs that are not in the ed spec. Excuse me? Instance. In the only instance in this project, or have there been instances in other building projects that you've worked with, Tom? No, this one. Okay, it just seems odd. It just seems kind of not right. Like, 
I mean, when we do a resolution, I guess, are we supposed to put in there that you can't do anything other than what's in the ad spec? So that you can't spend money and on other things? We're, we're not spending on anything except what's in the ad spec. Well, now you aren't, but yeah. there, were, there was a possibility that you were trying to we, squeeze we trying in to this take, extra classroom. What we were trying to do was find a cost for it. You were trying to what? Find a cost for it. Okay, and if the cost would fit into then the amount go, of money that the bodies have all approved. Uh, no, we'd go and get approval for it. You'd have to come back to us for yes. it. Yes, but we have to find out what it would cost first. Uh, okay, so, so you know you can't afford it, but you're kind of listing that as a savings to us. Well, it's a savings from the original estimate, yes. It's a savings from the original estimate as though you were approving it and you were going to put it into the, in, into, like you're listing this as a, as a reduction that is when correct. in actuality you had no money to be able to do this. Why would that be a reduction? Why wouldn't That's that a reduction be? from an estimate. It's just hard to understand yeah. because. You're following, right? You, you understand I'm, what Mr. Walsh is saying? Well, I know what he's saying. You're, you're, you're showing a, a reduction, a savings of 300 and what, 20,000? That's correct. Of an item that was never included in the first that place. That is also correct. Okay, so it's not really a savings. It's not really a savings. Well, it's, a it's, savings. it's a savings from the change that you made. That's correct. But it's not a savings from the original ed spec. Not from the sec ed spec. Right. Okay, it, so. Just me personally, I wouldn't include that as savings. I would, I, what I would say that is, is something that we decided, you decided you can't afford to add in. That's right. Right? But it's not a savings. So, it, we agree? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Basin, you were still? Yeah. I, I still have a problem with that practice. I want to follow up on you. Somebody had mentioned something about sanitary. Are we talking a sanitary sewer line? Some, uh, what is sanitary? There, there is very little documentation to the sanitary <coughs> piping, routing, or network that's within the existing school. So as part of this estimate, the 23640 estimate, we anticipated replacing all of the piping because we didn't ha we don't have that information to determine so what we have done as part of this is says we're not going to just go ahead and take an overly conservative approach and tell the contractor to remove it all we're going to tell them only to remove it from point a to point b so essentially we're reducing the amount of scope of the work this is all internal to the building. This it shouldn't be confused with discussions of the sanitary line that runs through our property. This is a different topic. This is a this relates okay, specifically th yeah, to within the building that we were anticipating in our original estimate to or in the design development estimate to remove it all. We rethought that and we're only going to be removing a portion of it. So that reduced the scope. All right, going back to this service line that's on there, how have we resolved that issue? So the service line we are showing on our documents that we are bypassing, and that's currently in the estimate. We are, we are bypassing the off-site sanitary that runs through our property. We're bypassing it, and that's going off to Mill Hill Terrace. And then we're also doing some other manipulation as it goes under our existing building and ties around to the addition. We're doing some other work on site. Um, so we've we've come up with some we've come up with design solutions that are captured in the budget that we're currently presenting to you now. Okay. The rooftop curbing has have you done an architectural rendering of how that is? Because I if I recall there was discussion about the rooftop units, when you're coming up Mill Hill, you're going to be able to see that because you're looking down on the building. So I assume that's why the curbing was put in place. No? no. The, I'm Marshall Moss. I'm with Gilbane Building Company with the construction managers. The rooftop curbing, actually, it's what the unit sits on. It's not the screening. So that's 
a specialized curbing that's required for noise control with the units as far as air movement and sound. That's what the rooftop curbing, I believe, that's being referenced here. Dave, I don't know if... So, so during our design development stage, we took a conser another conservative approach and designed acoustical uh, curbs. As what we mean acoustically is as the air comes directly out of the unit, it muffles it. It, it essentially dampers it. Uh, we, we designed a solution that was pretty expensive. So we went back and we value engineered another solution, make sure we still met code, the building codes, because the building code requires that we have certain acoustical ratings. And that's what essentially we're talking about, is we value engineered the curbing piece. That's separate from visibility of the unit. Our design, and we presented the planning and zoning last evening, our units, the new units that will go on the roof will be seen just as the existing will be seen. That's a separate issue from what we're specifically talking here. That was happening um, in Holland Hill. We had the same rooftop units, okay? But the, the space between the uh, ceilings, okay, and the rooftop was big enough. We didn't need to have acoustical curbing the airflow was big enough to minimize the, the sound. Here, it was too compressed. So we had to put in the curbing. Okay, so you're more concerned about the negative effect coming into the building, not the surrounding neighborhood. That's correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> getting back to the ed spec issue, can, can, can you forward the chairman a copy of where we are in ed specs and renderings and what we looked at in 2019 and what you're looking at now because as a taxpayer I want to make sure that what I'm approving is similar or actually it should be the same as what I approved in 2019 my fur has gone up because I saw that we added a room so I want to make sure that we're on track here and that you know at the end of the day I don't have uh, similar instances like we had in the past where well, where did that come from so I, I want to make sure that what we approved in 2019 is what you're looking at tonight and what you're pitching us. Now, I'm con I, I, beforehand, I guess I wasn't interested in seeing schematic drawings because I didn't think it was necessary because our overages were identified. But I'm seeing additional square footage. Not, I shouldn't say square footage. Additional space that wasn't discussed or approved by anybody. It, it causes me concern. I agree. Yes, I can furnish that without an issue. See, I'd, I'll just add this. You know, Tom, you, you run good building committees. But we've had, you run good building committees, okay? We've had, though, building committees that I personally feel have just taken on a life of their own and have just made changes that we were all very surprised at. And the board can correct my memory, but one of them was Roger Ludlow High School. Okay, is that right? The cafeteria. the cafeteria. Okay, so, Ms. Bassi, I want a. I, I, I didn't ask for bond council to be here tonight. Okay, but now I want. We we've gone through this before. I want his opinion on ed specs and bonding resolutions. Okay, and what is the leeway of a building committee, based on, based on what we're voting on. I've, I thought they had to be exact, but let's, let's get his opinion on that. Ms. I, Chairman? Yes, sir. I can assure you the only difference in this one was the steam room. Okay. I know. I understand. I believe that. But this is for future, future work as well, right? Um, Mrs. All right, Mr. DeWitt? Um, thank you. So a couple questions. Um, but comment on this this last thing you just mentioned. Um, we did have this same issue at Holland Hill. At Holland Hill, there was a there was a plan, and then the plan was changed within the ed specs supposedly, and that changed the funding numbers. And that's when we had to come back. You had to come back and and, and reduce the number at, at Holland Hill. At that point, we did talk to Bond Council, and he said, "No, the the ed specs are the ed specs." So we've we've had this we've had this already, but. We, we can do it again. 
Um, so I think you just answered my other question, Mr. Quinn. Everything else on this list, one through six, was in the original two, $22,600,000 estimate. Um, but what I don't understand here is um, when we get down to the SD, well, first off, there's a new project cost. You say that the $500,000, you have a million, which I wish, uh, $1,000 budget for abatement of hazardous material is not included. So, but, but why not? Because it's a separate fund, only for remediation. It's completely separate. Yep. And, and, <clears throat> and we're okay with that number? Because that's the number that always seems to come back and bite well, us, right? We currently are estimating that we're going to spend about 340000 of that right now. 340 Of the five hundred. And And even though you started with a 5% Cushion, he said, that was that eight hundred thousand dollars, right? Yes, the design continuously. Even though you started with that and have more than doubled it, if we were to make you take that, if we were making you use that right now, you you that would have been double, right? It's already been eliminated. You're you're okay with number six reducing the rest of the project to only three percent. You you guys are all okay. Your building committee is okay with that. With what? Sorry. Well, number six, the way I read it is, you had a five percent. Escalation. Escalation. Talk Isn't that the so, same thing as the 800,000? Yeah, it's uh, some of these percentages. So just to kind of put a little bit more description to those. So the escalation, as the project starts with inception of schematic design, which is further away from the construction start, typically the escalation is carried about 4% to midstream of construction, to mid midpoint. As we move closer to the start of construction, that escalation obviously is going to be less. So that gets reduced as the design prog progresses forward. So that's a separate, the escalation is a separate line item, if you will, from, it's, it's a contingency, but it's a separate line item relates to the owner contingency or the design contingency. It's, it's a separate contingency, if you will. So it's, di it's different than the 800,000, that's a- That's correct. So the design contingency- Building contingency, or- yeah, the design contingency, design contingency is related to, as the design is a concept stage, it's typically higher because not a lot of details. The drawings are only six or seven drawings. And as it progresses to schematic design, it turns into, say, 20 drawings. So there's more details. The design contingency gets reduced as more details get included into the design. And as we get into the construction documents, which is where we are now, those contingencies also get reduced down to zero because now the design is complete. So there's no need for carrying design contingency. That's what that. Okay. That's how that functions. Mr. Dewey, thank you. Can I, can I just follow up on that real quick? That. Yeah. That, so, I think you answered this. I just want to make sure. So the the eight hundred thousand dollar design contingency that's all gone now, right? That is correct. Okay, so all these numbers that's baked into all this already. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Okay, Mrs. Leclerc. I was going to request if you could put together a table for us that shows the original project that we approved in the different types of categories, how it was adjusted based on um, the new plans, and then show us where we are now, what the piece that we're approving. So I think you did something similar for Holland Hill that um, showed us on one page all the changes um, in a little more detail so so we could understand where things changed okay so whatever you and put together you can send to mrs. Bossy and then we'll take it from there all right any further comments questions mr. Walsh on the entire project yeah we'll keep moving on the entire project Okay, do you have any more of your presentation or do you made your entire presentation? I'll get the increases. Not part of the presentation. Yeah, we've only got 50. So as we develop the budget, as Dave indicated earlier, talk about value managing some of the aspects of the project, some of the scope items as the design evolved further, some other items had to be designed and included into the project. So those represent the stormwater detention system that was initially designed and after it went through, I believe it was conservation, if I'm not mistaken, 
that size of that stormwater detention system increased in size. So obviously that's necessary for the project. They had to be included in terms of the new value for it. So that represents about $200,000 worth of additional cost that had to be included into the project. We could not reduce the size of the detention system. We had to carry what was dictated, what was actually had to be approved. Was, was that, that stormwater? Yeah, yeah, I was going to jump in on that, but the question, I guess, for conservation, when you took this to conservation, did that plan have this steam classroom in it? No, we were... Because if it did, if it did, you don't need the roof space anymore for the, for, you could have actually lower your, you, you, you can lower your retention capacity. It, it's fairly minor for the 700 square feet of area, but in theory, yes, we can reduce it, but not significantly to where to where we were from schematics. What do you think it would be averse? You're asking for 200,000 based on the approval with this extra classroom that wasn't in the ed spec. Now, if you take this 700 square feet off of it, how much savings of there is there on the $200,000? It's it's essentially minimal because the work is the work isn't necessarily an additional square footage of structure. The majority of the work is the excavation and the piping to get to there it's it's a very small percentage a half of a percent at best it's it's barely insignificant Is it uh, five thousand ten thousand dollars yes ten thousand okay yeah but in the context of bidding yes it could range between that yes as we go to item b the added shoring for the support of the retention system the way this retention system is actually because it goes into the side of the hill again for the excavation not only the retention system but there's the shoring system that goes along with it for the excavation so i have to retain the earth so there was a, a an upgrade to that system which is about seventy thousand dollars for the shoring itself is the shoring for the additional retention capacity or is it for the entire is is it is it for the retention system itself it's a structural related item not a stormwater related item it's a structural issue because of the topography of the property correct that okay. is correct okay is that something new there's something that you guys didn't know about in regards to the yeah, so topography there's, so there's two items so um post schematic design we um we engage with a geotechnical engineer who came out and performed soil borings in the areas of any of our additions. At that point, it, we discovered um, the soil conditions um, and knew what, and we looked at some various options as to how we're going to structurally support that building, the addition, essentially the four classroom in the rear. Uh, and we knew that um, we needed to remove a good amount of soil. And by doing that, we needed to create some type of shoring um, as we may potentially undermine the existing building because we're digging below the existing footings. And we're also digging out right to sort of the toe of the slope, right at the top of that slope. So this is all a byproduct of further due diligence that we did from schematics to design development is when we discovered we needed to do this additional work that's well beyond just standard conventional construction. Mr. Matola. So on number A, the increased stormwater retention capacity. If I'm understanding you correctly, you went to conservation with what you designed and they wanted you to do something else which increased it by two hundred thousand dollars is that what happened yeah so um during schematics we 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 anticipate what a general site design scope will be we haven't run stormwater calculations we haven't done any of the sizing of stormwater yet but we we look at a general cost per square foot of of site development when we got into the develop, design development drawings, that's when we ran the overall stormwater calculations. We also had a wetlands component and we flagged the wetlands. And from there, the methodology was determined through conservation as to the volume or capacity of stormwater we needed to account for. And essentially that doubled what, or added the 200,000 that what we anticipated um, during schematics. 
Isn't that just a square footage calculation of the roof? Of like how much the square footage, so that all that storm water from those roofs on the square footage. And didn't you know the what that square footage was based on their basic design, or did the design change over time? Um, both. It, it obviously is a squ square footage determines the volume that you are calculating, but it's also the methodology of the conditions that are on site guide you into how much you are actually going to be the capacity. So it's not just overall square footage, it's also what you shall include within your calculations. So and that's the difference. Did you present a, a plan to deal with this to the Conservation Commission that you thought was sufficient, but they made you do something else? Is that what happened? There was an increase, yes, there was a change in design, design calculations, and that happened at design development during schematics you don't have that information to present okay I'll, I'll jump over to mr bateson yeah quick thing drilling down on this a little bit more i from what i'm hearing we had a pretty good handle on the square footage of what we needed to do or what was going to generate our stormwater retention what i'm hearing is, is it sounds like we had to relocate where the actual system was going to be because of soil conditions. I, is that a fair assessment? So it's a combination of maybe conservation saying you need to do more and then where we originally thought we were going to put the soil, the stormwater retentions like the geo guy came out and said it, it's not going to have a good perk rate, you're going to have to move it over to here where the soil's better and that means more trenching, more piping, more, more of this, more sloping and all that. So we started a schematic design and we have, we're, we're, we're starting with just the basic idea of a plan. It matures to you get to, get to design development. That design contingency that we talked about is supposed to cover some of those items that we haven't included. In this case, when we got to the design development stage and presented it to conservation, that well exceeded the contingency piece to cover that. So um, it, it's going from concept to the reality of what needs to be done, and that's really the difference. It's just the maturity of the plan for this particular site. Mr. Testani, I, I just I think we should call for a brief recess and a, w when we're ready to for us to have a brief meeting. Okay. We'll, we'll take a, a recess to talk in executive session. We can't. What it, what's a recess for? Not not for something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions, comments on this well, particular line item? Right? Words, yeah, no, on this line item. Right. Yep. So any other further questions on this line item? If not, we'll move on to where you see. Okay, so item C actually, Dave alluded to it earlier, uh, under the addition, the classroom addition, after further soil development and soil investigative work, and there was a geo geotechnical report that was issued during the design development phase, there was significant amount of soil that had to be removed. The bearing capacity where the addition is sitting on and the existing soil conditions were not adequate. So the recommendations by the new geotechnical report was to remove, over excavate under the addition and reinforce that by providing some geotextile uh, reinforcement system that fairly robust system in order to make sure that the addition itself obviously you don't want it to settle so there's a lot of there's different methods of addressing it. you can drive piles on those aspects of it but this was the recommendation that was made by the geotech engineer in his report to be able to support this particular addition so that's the uh, the cost associated with that removal of that soil bringing in more suitable soil and actually reinforcing that soil. I think the depth was about six to eight feet additional excavation in order to make sure that the soil capacity can bear the addition. That work's been done? 
or is that work going no, to be done? No, that that work okay. would be done as we di as we dig. That's what I thought. I, yes. But he was talking. You were talking in the past tense a little bit, so it almost sounded like it was done. Because my next questions were going to be, where'd you get the soil from? And I'm glad we don't. I'm glad. And I'm glad we don't have to go down that road. So I'm glad we don't have to go down that road. So we're that's still good. on paper. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Excellent. Okay. Any further questions on this item? Okay. Moving on to building interior systems. So building interior systems, uh, piping in the tunnel, very self-explanatory, is replacing all the HVAC piping inside the tunnel area itself. The original intent was not to replace it all. And now after investigative work by the design team, it was the recommendation was to remove all that piping, which is the heating system that's in the tunnel, because I believe it surpassed its lifespan. Yeah, the ex actually between schematic design and through design development, one of the boilers actually failed. So the district did emergency replacement of the boiler. That determined that there was corrosion in that piping. So at this point, this original piping that's 50 years old, our recommendation is if we're going to be replacing all the other components um, and do boiler improvements, we should also replace the network of piping um, as opposed to keeping that. What is just, I'm sorry for my ignorance on this. What is the tunnel? The tunnel is basically the crawl space underneath the building where all the distribution piping is. Okay. Okay. It's a complete crawl space under the entire building. Yes. Correct. Okay. Around the perimeter. Yep. Around the, per around the perimeter only. Yes. That okay. is correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any questions on the tunnel? All right, then we're on item B. So HVAC controls, that's basically the building management system, the temperature control system, as again, as the design advanced further, more the mechanical units are starting being identified, and what are the requirements for controls? The, we just basically, it's uh, based on the information that we received from the design team and going out to vendors and getting the pricing for the new control system as designed at that stage of time there was an increase of about $70,000 for controls for the building management system. Now there are more details, more information than schematic design. We're about 50% design, plus or minus from where we were about 25%. So there's just more information to be able to price it more accurately. Are these the same type of building control systems? Uh, maybe Tom, you, you're better to answer this, that are in like Holland Hill and, and the other schools. Yes. So, so it's nothing more advanced, it's the same things. You're just getting better pricing when you figured out what you needed. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, actually the basis of the design is the same system that you did at Holland Hill um, and then it's just tailored to this particular building. I guess next unless anybody else. Right? No, sorry. Yep. Any other questions on this item? Okay, moving on. So item C uh, pertains to millwork. Uh, the original a schematic design uh, was included only replacing the ADA millwork related to the ADA requirements when the design development uh, was provided. It included replacing all the millwork and above and beyond the ADA, basically replacing all with new. And whose request was that at? That was that was basically because it was poor shape. It was not in good shape, so we had to replace it. Explain to me what the millwork is. So the millwork is all the cabinetry, all of the cabinets and cubbies and uh, the wardrobes, uh, basically the laminate um, casework that's in, the, in, each, in each classroom. It's uh, the cabinetry, basically the, wo the wood cabinetry. Why wasn't that addressed when we this project was brought before us? I mean, we went on tour of this building. We saw the cubbies. We saw it, the closets. For, we honestly, saw all that stuff. We missed it. And the SD. Missed it. Okay. Did we replace all of the same stuff at Holland Hill? We did. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, Mr. Walsh. Anyone else on the mill work? Okay, item D. So item D is an incremental electrical infrastructure. As the design got more advanced, the phasing uh, for the project, and that pertains to the actual construction phasing of the project, 
uh, we have to maintain the existing building live because it's occupied as we build the addition. The electrical system on this particular building is rather complex. The switchgear room, the existing switchgear uh, equipment is in the basement where the mechanical room is. And we have to maintain the building live while we actually install the new switchgear off the new addition. So there's infrastructure that we have to back feed and it's fairly substantial infrastructure in order to maintain the existing building off the new service. So it's more of has to do with the way the phasing for the building as we learn more about the building and how the new design is going to be complementing the existing building as we renovate it. So that particular is just additional infrastructure that was captured in the design development. And that's customarily does happen as we further the, the design get advanced and more systems we get to see more of the mechanical, electrical and other plumbing systems we have to figure out and complement that design and how we can actually maintain the phasing in order to construct and renovate the building itself while it's being occupied. Mrs. Marmy. I just have a question on the electrical infrastructure. Can you give us some background on where we are with solar panels on this school, where we're going, uh, if any of this is included, and are there cost savings that have been accounted for from that from the solar panels and where are we going with that? Sure. So the building already has solar panels. You may not uh, be able to see them from the road, but they're they're fairly low profile ones that are located um, just over the um, second and third grade classrooms um, that we're proposing. So there's already solar panels that are there and they're in good exposure. The rest of the building doesn't have great exposure because of the numerous mechanical units that will be placed there that will provide um, shading to that. So it reduces the overall um, efficiency of that. In terms of the building systems that we are putting in place as part of this, by adding air conditioning, by changing over the boilers from steam to hot water, we're improving the efficiency of those systems. Those are now, um, will meet the Connecticut High Performance Building Standard Guideline for the work that we are doing, which is essentially, we are 20% we are better than the average building code. So we are mandated, our systems that we are putting in place meet the Connecticut high performance building standards. Uh, so just to follow up on that, so our, our, our savings uh, in your estimates, do they incorporate the, that 20% more efficient uh, no, that no? that's 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 operating costs. That's not upfront costs. Moving yes. forward. Yes. Okay, thank you. And there are no plans because of the exposure, et cetera, to add more solar panels. There's not an opportunity with an expanded roof. No. No. Okay. Not as planned. Thank yes. you. Okay. Just let me go to Mr. Yeah, Bateson. Mr. Bateson. Yeah, quick thing. The the new electric service is going in the new addition. That is correct. At the tail end of the fourth grade, at the kindergarten wing, and the back And I imagine the old service is near the boiler room. The the uh, it's actually un, uh, it's near the boiler room, but actually uh, in a vault under the stage. And that's going to be abandoned. That will be eventually abandoned. That's correct, because we're actually mo okay. removing that stage um, and increasing the size of the APR. All right. So th so the cost is basically you're going to be running two services for a while. We will back. So you have to service the old building. So. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Getting back to what Ms. Marmy was asking about the solar panels, is this building going to be rated for a LEED standard? Um, no, we are not seeking LEED certification. Um, the Connecticut High Performance Building Standards is an equivalency to a LEED Silver. Um, we are an alteration project. We're not a renovate as new project. So um, we're, only, we're only touching the areas that are new need to comply with that component. If we were doing a full renovate as new, then every component of the building would need to meet that. And uh, de facto, that is a lead silver, uh, lead silver equivalency. Equivalency for the new things. For the new things, that's correct. Yes. But we are not seeking any um, certification, any independent third party certification. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Okay, next item. Okay, so the next item is roof curbs. Dave touched on this one. So 
as the design from schematic design to design development was evolving, the roof curbs were called for all the units throughout the project itself. After discussions with the design team, this dollar amount represents the curbs that are needed in specific locations, not everywhere that, so they've done their STC rating throughout and they have made recommendations that only in certain areas are absolutely needed. I believe the media center is one of them. Basically what it comes down to is the Connecticut law right now has a coastal um, objectives for classrooms, not for hallways or any other ancillary rooms. So we were able to take some of that out, okay? So it's sixty-five thousand dollars more for that, for those curbs. That's correct. That's from the schematic design where they were not there. Now we're only carrying sixty-five thousand where they're absolutely needed, and based on their recommendations, that's correct. And, and so the yet, reason why they are the reason why they're ne needed, and Tom alluded to that, is that the what we call the interstitial space from the top of the roof deck down to the ceiling is fairly low. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the distance to be able to attenuate that sound. We need to add these special curbs. So that's what that is related to. So you're adding $65,000 for those curbs, but you're deducting $85,000 for HVAC curbs in other areas. So we, why wouldn't you just say that net-net we're saving $20,000 on curbs? I, I don't understand. <laughs> you want me to... The total value is actually the both, if you, 85,000 plus the 65 is actually more like a $150,000. That's what the curves are worth in totality. So as the design team went through the design development, they were made recommendation to eliminate them in certain areas that represents the $85,000 reduction. We still have to carry 65 in the base. Okay. So the curves were new and the you originally put in a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then you value engineered it when you realized you were over and deducted eighty five thousand dollars of curbs more um, the value management of the process is that that's typical of all construction you go through the design and you say all right now we have some challenges as it relates to budget and where we can find some areas that we can actually save and that's not going to impact or make any uh, detriments to the design and we seek the designers guidance on that as far as looking and value manage those processes and those are the areas they recommended indicating that curbs in those locations are not needed we still meet code and sound uh, requirements and STC rating we don't need them in those however in those locations we absolutely have to have them and that's what the 65,000 represents Mr. Matola so so these curbs were not originally part of the schematic design is that just a just the standard sheet metal curb which was what is typical baseline design we then got into the design development discovered our challenges we then designed it everywhere they estimated and said you can't afford that we then decided what we could keep what we could eliminate and essentially yes there's a net change to that Any further questions on this item? All right, then we're at item F, overall cost increases as more in depth. So this particular item applies to the balance of the divisions. There are about 22 divisions across, so we've hit some specific areas, but generally speaking as, you know, you have the concrete, the steel, all those as more details show up on the documents, there's about a 1% adjustment to all those more details on some of them are will go up 2%, some of them will go up 1%. So that's across the entire project in areas that we didn't discuss, the balance of the project. We didn't talk about concrete, we didn't talk about equipment, furnishings, we didn't talk about the plumbing, we touched on some of it. But the balance of the project experienced as more details show up on the documents and as we quantify more and now the numbers, you know, we go from, as I indicated earlier, from 25 sheets of drawings and literally a guideline of, uh, of specifications to the design development, it's about 150 sheets with two volume of specifications. So it's just more information for the estimators to be able to quantify more accurately and be able to 
priced items accurately. So there was about a 1% across the balance of the project that represents that $210,000. Mr. Matola. So your your next step, if this is approved, you're you're going to go out to bid, right? That's correct. Okay. When is that going to happen? All right. Mid, mid to late April. Okay. And I mean, when you go out to bid, could you? Is there the possibility that you may achieve some savings? Absolutely. Okay. Or it could be higher. Or it could be higher. Right. No, but it's a crapshoot, and this environment is a real crapshoot. All right. Okay, any further comments? Yeah. Mr. Walsh. Okay. So I see where your variance on both pages, pages two and three, is 1,275. And that's the approximately one says two thousand one million two seventy four nine hundred is what you're asking for, right? That's, that's what you're asking for. Where is the variance page that shows how you spent the eight hundred thousand dollar design contingency? Because I'd like to know how that was spent. Because that that hasn't been explained. So it was this 1 .5, wasn't it? it was eight hundred. They they had an eight hundred thousand dollar design contingency so and what hasn't been explained is that's a big chunk of money how you spent that so 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 that design contingency essentially rolls up into all those other divi divisions so there was a five percent correct there was the five uh, five percent that was just added across the board um, so for each of those divisions that money now gets brought into that um, so we could have asked for 10% or you could have gone to 15% design contingency or essentially 1.275 million of additional contingency. 5% is what you reasonably work with. Th that money gets just distributed and filtered into any of the divisions. 5% should go into concrete because I don't have 5% of the detail there. 5% should go into steel mechanical plumbing. Well, we're showing you the items that went well beyond that 5%, items that we discovered while we were doing our due diligence. So in the design, in coming up with that design stuff, you're saying it's all throughout the entire project? That's how it's calculated during schematic design because our drawings are only, our drawings only have a certain amount of information we're only able to depict so much. We know we haven't progressed and shown everything on the plans. We haven't thought of everything. We haven't done our food did full due diligence. So there's something missing in our design. So we, uh, we add 5% and say that covers the entire project. And as it matures, it's going to eventually filter itself into those other line items. And when we get to the end of the project where we are, there is no more design contingency. It's just filtered into those other line items. There's, there's no taking H65 um, and then taking 15,000 for windows, 100,000 for this. It really comes down to, you know, when we put together, we needed 21 windows. By the time they did the design work and did all of the drawings, those design windows cost a certain amount, okay, and whatever that amount was we went in okay and then at the bottom line we take the 865 out the 865 you're talking about the design contingency oh i thought it was 800 well 800 800 okay okay i'm just being confused so so it's 800 so you know you're going to spend that 800 yes was that already going to be spent before when you first started Yes. In my judgment, how, how, it was, how, yes. How? I thought it was a contingency. How's no, it not it's a, a design contingency. contingency. It's, a design because contingency. it's a design contingency. It's items that we know that we have not shown for Amar and his team to actually uh, quantify and assign value to. So we know that we need that, that we're going to need to fit. We're going to need to design 
to that and that's the way the industry works is you you put a contingency aside for items that you haven't anticipated yet and you know that you're most likely going to spend them in some cases you you may not and in some cases you will you start with five percent and say okay there's probably five percent that i just don't know at this point that most likely I'm going to I'm going to spend and, but you you determine where that's going to go when you get to the next stage when you're able to itemize each one and add quantity to 200 pages See, when I thought about design contingency when I thought about design contingency and we put these numbers in there I'm thinking the design contingency is going to this the things that came up along the way so we have an extra eight hundred thousand dollars in there that you would apply it against things we didn't know of. It seems to be a different definition. It is. It is a different definition. Those were unforeseen events. Okay, unforeseen events. Okay, are different than a design contingency. When you do a design in a SC process, you got one diagram. Uh, for a room, okay. By the time that room is totally exploded in a design development, you may have 40 different charts, yeah. all of which have very specific things that go on it, and that's where you end up using your design contingency, and that's totally uh, consistent with every project I've been on. Are there times when we save on that eight hundred thousand dollars throughout the project? On that eight hundred thousand, I'm not necessarily no. Well, where you save it, we always spend it. Well, it's not a question of spending it. It's a question is it's there for a reason, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, where you save is when you go to bid. Okay. Okay, that's where, you know, you have all your elements out there, all your designs, and you find out what the people are willing to, to ask for to do that. And that's where you make either up or down money. Okay. So we need a different name than contingency. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's, it need, sounds like we didn't we need, need a different name than it's contingency. contingency. It's a different it's piece. Not, it's not it's not the same as a building contingency. It's no. not a, it's different. not the owner's it's Maybe not the owner's contingency which is intended for unforeseen or added scope items. This is a this, this is just dealing with design items that can't be contemplated at that time. All right. I, is 5% the standard in industry? During schematics you want to start with 5, yes. Okay. Yeah, at least. Was Holland you know, Hill 5%, do you remember? I'm sorry? Do you know if design contingency at Holland Hill was 5% I, or I think higher? we were closer to 7, actually. But we could have been 7 and... I they would have pushed for it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was your question. Does anyone else have any comments? Well, y y just I've, in your report... Mr. Walsh. Tom, in your report on your third paragraph, you write, this project reflects the impact of setting budgets without getting engineering reports. Right? Correct. So what do you suggest since this happens with every project? Every single project. And I would be surprised if we don't see you again. What? <laughs> So what do you what do you what do you suggest? Yeah, well, this is a process that it, it just wastes a lot of time. Oh God! And here's yes. something else. When yeah. we were debating about a 504 and a 441, all right, we said the difference was around a million. Man, but million we don't one. know. We have no idea what the difference is. But that was a you know that was a debating point. But so we were debating off false numbers. But, right? but We're the, debating on numbers that don't really exist. Well, that's true. But, but the gap for you exists. You knew there was a gap. Is it 1-1 one, one or 0.8 or but one, my, my point is we don't really know. We don't know. No, not at that point. Right, not at that point. No. So, I mean, we should, we should state that at well, that time. We don't know. The, an we, the and, and we don't know what the 504 cost would be today if we, you know, with, with everything that you've learned since the past year. It'd be higher. Yeah, it would be higher. That's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you, too. I mean, if we had a 504, 
all of these issues that you've lined up would be higher. Would be higher. Yeah. Yes. Excuse right. me. It, it, you, yeah, it, incremental. Uh, yeah, you yeah. could confidently look at the numbers that we have right now and incrementally increase that per cost per square foot at this point because you have a you have a set of documents that have now more value than purely just a conceptual plan. So my yeah. question was, and I'll go back to you, is what do you suggest? Is well, it <coughs> setting a budget or an estimate on SD, okay, you're going to create the same problem every single time because you don't have any in-depth work, any engineering work, okay? I, I would suggest that we, we look at setting up a process, okay, and I don't have the answer completely, but I would get a process that allows you to go out there, spend money for engineers, borings, okay, taking a look at the electrical uh, title description of these things to see if they're major surprises in what you're going to need. So, because right now, we're going there with a, a cookie cutter, okay? The SC is a cookie cutter, okay? And then we go out there and find out what it really is going to cost. I'm being honest. But I, I agree with you. It's just that it's never over, right? We're never underneath that number. We always guess less, right? And that's, it'd be nice one day if we guess and we say, hey, we have money left over. But I get it. I hear what you're saying, and it's a good suggestion, and I think, I think we need that. to think about a, a different process. Yes. Thank you. Mr. DeWitt? To, just to add to that, we gave this building committee $1.5 million to start their work. So when I hear we gave you 1.5 million and we don't, and there's a list of don't haves, mm -hmm. I mean, what is, what would that number be if we were getting engineering things like you were talking about? Is it, no. I mean, 10 million? No. I mean, I don't know. I mean, 1.5 million is a roof. We just talked about Osborne Hill roof is a million bucks, right? So, I mean, we, we put up 1.5 million and we're a million bucks off. I feel like we could do this, we could do this in the back of an envelope and get this close and then still be dealing with, with, with these kind of, you know, this, the same discussion and be a million bucks off, but we wouldn't have spent a million five up front. Well, we didn't spend a million five. How much did we spend? What? You know what my next question is going to be when you tell me how much you really spent, right? No, it's under. I, yeah, I know. Where'd that go? <clears throat> okay, you only spent a million. So where'd that six hundred thousand go? Is that rolling into the? It just you has. It oh, just you can't use that. It's a separate bonding resolution, right? It's. It's encumbered money. It's it's oh, so that rolls into these numbers yes. too. Yes, that is correct. So you're off by one point eight million. 600 left over from contingency and the extra 1.2. No, it's encumbered co uh, contracts between the architects. And you have 600,000. You had a $22 million estimate. You had 600,000 dollars left over. You came back and said, "I need 1.2 million left." More. And you already had 600, so it was 1.8, isn't it? Or is the 600 part of the 1.2? It's part of the 22. It's part of the 22. Except I don't see that on your puts and takes. That should have been one of your puts, right? It's there. We know it's there. It's not a put or anything. Just part well, of it is. Process. It's an addition. It's an it's an additional monies on top of the twenty two million dollars you were you were given as a bonding resolution. No, it's not. It's part of it. There was originally the one five. Um, then the 22 came forward. The 22 included the 1.5. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Mr. Walsh. So in regards to the additional work that needs to be done, you have it split up into two sections, site work and building interior systems. 
And does this site work kind of specifically, it seems to be all related in, in one way or another to the topography of that property, which is challenging. And we've <laughs> known that for a long time. Correct? Correct. Okay. And as you said, if we had gone with a 504 instead of a 440 sized student school, um, it would have been, you think, incrementally, approximately. I mean, it, it'd be it's not exact. It, it'd be incremental because all these other items, we were just adding those additional classrooms onto that. So it, it'd be incremental. Well, I guess thank God that we'd gone the 440 for two reasons. One, it would have been a lot more. And two, because some of the numbers presented and where the school population is going have shown a drop off in students that's going to be happening. And we also have excess capacity in the schools. So thank God we had done the 440 because on the 504, we would have just been wasting more of taxpayers' money. Um, and this gets kind of down to what we've always known about this building, going back to, I think when we first started talking about this, I think it was 2016 or 2017 in the capital plan when it was first presented that you wanted to, that the town was going to need to expand Holland Hill. And that number, I'm going off the top of my head, I think was like a 462 building. And we saw coming up later on was Mill Hill School, um, which was listed at a 504. Actually, no, I think it was a little bit lower than that. And, and we on this board started saying that maybe Holland Hill should be done at 504 because it was a lot flatter property and didn't have the challenge in topography. Because it was always my fear that, I know, no, but it wasn't supposed to be designed when it was first being presented. Um, Dr. Title made those presentations and wanted a, Holland Hill to be smaller. And it was this body that, after going through talking about it, started saying because of the challenging topography up at Mill Hill and the added expense it could be to build on that topography versus building on a flatter piece of property at Holland Hill, that maybe we should make Holland Hill a 504 and then potentially make Mill Hill a smaller school because of the extra dollars it would cost to build it. And this is all proving that out now that, you know, here we are doing a 440, approving a number and having a budget, and here's another $530,000 in site work that we did not know we were going to have to have because of that challenging topography, correct? It is what it is. It's 500000 Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Matola. Um, I mean, my recollection of all that was this board and certain members of this board wanted us to look carefully at Mill Hill being a 504 school. And this board changed its mind when we, when we were funding this project, members of this board did. So, I mean, my recollection, you want to talk about the history, is that this board consistently said we should build 504 schools when possible. And we all understood that Mill could be a problem uh, because it's topography, but um, it was the intent of this board, my understanding over the years, was that we wanted 504 schools when we were doing additions. We went back and forth. You know, one of the things Mr. Walsh said about the school population, and, and we probably don't want to get go down this road too much. Right. There is a difference. Right. There's a difference. I mean, the projections change, and they're, they're, they're trending lower right now. They're going to change again. Yeah, but there is a difference now of 130 students in elementary from what we saw in June to what we see in November. Okay. Any further comments on the building itself? 
I do have a question. Was there any problems that you had with the sanitary sewer lines that you discovered as you were going through the project? Because there's rumors that some of these cost expenses were because you didn't know where the sanitary sewer line was or, or it turned out to be someplace it wasn't. Can you discuss if there was any of those problems and what they were and how they might have drove these costs? So as it relates to the sanitary line outside of the property itself, currently the site takes on ex the existing system, it drains from the properties through the actual school property itself and exits to the south. The new design actually takes separates those two systems. So whatever that's coming off site from the adjoining properties, now it's going out to Mill Hill Terrace through a, mass, a new sanitary manhole. So the two systems effectively being separated. The school itself has its own sanitary line that's being replaced on the exterior underneath the portables. That's all going to be removed and that's still going to exit to the south, but that only drains the school itself. Whatever that's coming off site from the joining properties is going out to a different system, different line. So they are being separated. And did the committee or you guys not know about that when this was all started? Not until, uh, no, not no. until you go from schematic design, you do an A2 survey, you map out exactly where the routing is going, you review the existing conditions, and then essentially you determine that there is uh, piping that was running from off-site through our property and discharging off our property. Okay, you can't get those diagrams and maps from the town in advance? We didn't have them. No, we didn't. We did not have that information at the schematic design phase. But the town had that information, correct? I'm not sure. You're not, pipes you're not sure whether the town knew where their sewer system was running through? That's one way to paraphrase it. Okay. <laughs> uh, really? I that's said it was that, one way. That, that's interesting. But uh, these pipes were running underneath uh, the addition that was built in 79, I believe. 1979. And no one knew that in 79 they, that they, they built, built on top it. of the town sewer line? Yeah. They built it. Okay. And it, you didn't, you guys, you like, it was a surprise to the town that that's where they went? I can't say that. Okay. But I can tell you that it's, they were built underneath. Okay. We, we can say that typically you do not see other sanitary piping or even stormwater from other property running through somebody's property unless there is a defined easement uh, there. And mm -hmm. there was none. So at that time of schematics, there was no known easements to, for, to key us into where, how, where that was routing. I'll 100% concur with that statement. <laughs> there should have been an easement, right? That's typical practice. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of the costs that are listed on page three, you decided to reroute and just have Mill Hill be its own sewer project, basically, and then you had to reroute the other um, sewage that was coming on from the other properties and reroute it back where onto the street or something? Back out to Mill Hill Terrace. Mill Hill Terrace. No, that was in um, through a series of meetings with the WPCA and the Department of Public Works. And were there additional costs that that drove that are that are here? How much is the underneath? So the the cost for rerouting the sanitary line onto Mill is approximately about a hundred thousand dollars to reroute it because it is a deep line involves uh, there's a couple of big structures obviously it's in the middle of the road so there'll be it's that has its own uh, cost associated with it the hundred it's about a hundred thousand dollars worth of sanitary line reroute and what line item is that part of this is it part of the site work and like a b or c no that's not included in those numbers because this represents only the on-site work that's being done that's a uh, a that's a town cost, if you will. Oh, so it's going to be another $100,000 for the town to do that work on top of this. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Bateson? Yeah, that's what I wanted to follow up on. I recall this discussion when I was a selectman on the WPCA. This issue came up about the sewer lateral that runs through the property. Uh, 
the discussion I recall was is it's unusual to see something like that. It was it was a surprise at the time when the WPCA found the line there. Um, it does happen though, since it's town-owned property. They, you know, it, it it wouldn't be unusual to see something happen. I recall exactly what they said that the WPCA was going to reroute it because they didn't want the line under a building. I, if I recall, they're going to abandon that line in place and reroute so that it can be serviceable in the future and that they redesigned the tie-in for the new facility to run somewhere else. And it was going to be split in between WPCA and the building committee. So I imagine you're going to have, you're probably going to, in your budget, pay for your service tying into the street. And then WPCA was like, yeah, that's our bad. We never should have put the addition on top of the sewer line. We're going to reroute everything. And I, I do recall that discussion, and they did have, uh, I think they were going to take it out of their, uh, put it in an operation or take it out of the reserve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Basin. Any further questions, comments from the board? If not, I'm, Mr. Testani? I just have, uh, just to go back a little bit, um, when we first started talking, we were talking about the cost in general, right? And I know we were talking about some of the estimates for increasing costs from some of the be going out to other kids we're considering. That's one part of my question. The other part is what about the design specs in terms of are there any other abnormalities, for lack of a better word, with regard to the ed specs? Is there something else besides the fact that there are 700 roughly square feet that weren't included in here that we're not aware of that could have come up today? I think you had sort of a two-part question. The first one was related to just cost escalation. Um, so um, th as we mature through the project and get closer to bid, we eliminate the cost escalation because we're going out to bid real time as when we were developing this nine months ago, we added a factor onto that. So at this point, there's no cost escalation because we're going out to bid essentially in real time in, in a month or two. So so that I, I think that answers your question in terms of escalation and sourcing. We haven't put an additional, at this point, we haven't put an additional factor on on bid escalation. Well, not, not to interrupt you, but at the beginning, we were talking about the coronavirus and how the cost is going to increase dramatically from what we were told at the beginning of the meeting because of the increase of costs from some of the parts that we might be getting from China. Yeah, I think we're just putting it in context that the estimates that are shown today were estimates of normal, normal cost of business. It doesn't reflect potentially if there is going to be any impact on sourcing of materials. That's all we're, that's all we're really saying is right now this estimate was, was prepared in the context of normal practices. Right. No, I understand. What I'm asking is what are we doing to circumvent that? What are we doing to try to prepare I, for that? As Dave indicated, uh, during normal market conditions, those estimates represent that. During the times that we're in right now, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen because if China shuts down totally, we, we always look for alternative resources. Fortunately, the, the project itself does not have those special elements that, uh, you know, you're talking about brick more. A lot of the stuff is fabricated in the United States that so will be able to source it, but then there'll be also competition for that same material by other projects. So there'll be those demands as well. So again, it's very difficult to predict it because it's all new information, new, new circumstances that we are dealing with. We have not seen the effect of that, those conditions because it's so recent as what it's doing to the market and the rest of the pricing structure that's out there. So it's very difficult to be able to quantify it at this point because it's just very recent. All right. I just want to, at this point, open this to the public. If there's any public comment, you don't have to comment. Uh, anybody? All right, then it's back to the board. Mr. Walsh. 
I'd like to make an amendment to the bonding resolution um, based on what we had heard earlier so that we're, we're all on the same page and everyone understands that the 20, and I don't have any problem with the money, so of, of the stuff that you're asking for. But I do want there to be a change in the resolution to state that the money can only be spent on the, the, um, the cost to renovate and expand Mill Hill Elementary School pursuant to the educational specification that was dated at the time we did the approval. Done. So, uh, which means I need to amend, my motion is to amend under the resolve section, paragraph one, four lines down, after Mill Hill Elementary School, comma, I would like to insert only to be spent on the construction cost to renovate and expand Mill Hill Elementary School pursuant to the educational specification dated, and I don't know if anybody has that document here Not to know what, the, what that educational specification was dated. I okay. Think it was December. No, he's, he's looking it up. Here we go. I'll second so. it, Jim. The Board of Ed approved the original Ed Specs February 13, 2018, but revised it June 11, 2019 to reduce it from the 504 to the 441. So my motion in regards to after the word dated will be the, well actually I probably should say to the amended yes. educational specifications dated June 11th, 2019. I'll second. Okay, second by Mr. Testani. Mr. Matola. I, I have absolutely no problem with that. My only question is, does it have to go back to the Board of Selectmen? Because we're changing this bonding resolution. That, that's my only question. Well, I guess. Um, if it I, does, I, and I, there's I, no reason, yeah. it's not delaying anything. I'm just, that's what I'm concerned about. That's all. My suggestion would be that Mr. Chairman, you after if we approve this, that you have Ms. Bossy refer to our bond council to see whether it does, and if it does, it'll have to go back to the to them. I mean, they may they meet twice a month. Would it have to go back? I think if you change the language in this bond resolution, it needs to go back. Okay, I think it's worth going back. So I still my motion stands as is, and it can be determined whether it needs to go back. And then they can determine whether they want to uh, discuss it again, approve it, or not approve it. I'm not sure that we've ever put language like this in a bond resolution itself, so I'm not yeah. sure if this is where it belongs or not, or an addendum or something else. I'm not sure. It's just these bond resolutions are normally pretty standard, so I'm not sure if it's a may want to reference a schedule a or a an addendum yeah. or something to it yeah. as well but obviously Pullman and Kamala can speak a little bit more but I believe if we change this yes. it needs to go back okay um, and, and and I understand that we don't know because we don't have a bond council here so um, I want it in there because and I think we're gonna probably have to have this in there I mean I don't know how the board feels I know how I feel that I don't I learned something new tonight and that I didn't understand that we could potentially add rooms onto something. So when we approve something, and I approved this when it was done, and I thought we were building pursuant to the ed, ed specification. I didn't understand that we can add things or potentially add things if there's savings of money. And I think we've got to be very specific going forward that we are only building to what we all, all the town bodies approve. And, and if that means getting the bond, um, because the other problem is, is that if there was changes, the Board of Education could change their ed specification and still do it. All they'd have to do is have a meeting saying, hey, we want to amend it from the June 11, 2019 version 
to a, a new one, and then it would meet those requirements that they built pursuant to the ed specification. So in order to prevent that, I'd like this language added on and it's modified. And if this is not the right way to do it and bond council says it has to come back to the board of finance or to the board of selectmen, so be it. I mean, I'd be really even willing to have a special meeting about it. If well, we we're going to meet, we're going to meet in, if we need, need yeah. to. But we're going to be meeting one way or another next week. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it can be added to that agenda, but I'll, cause those are special I, meetings. I, I don't think but I, I don't disagree with you. I don't think it's a big deal just pointing it out. I go let it go let bond council look at it and if the board of selectmen has to say yes, I'm sure they'll say yes and then we're done with it. That's it. Okay. It's not gonna hold it up is what your point is. So now we need to vote on the amendment. Mr. Walsh made the amendment, Mr. Testani seconded the amendment. So all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. Aye. Okay, that is unanimous. Now we go back to the bonding resolution as amended. So can I have a mo I move? I move to approve it as amended. As amended. Mr. Walsh, Mrs. Charlton seconds it. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. And that's unanimous. And I will uh, follow up with Mrs. Bossy over the next couple of days. And if there's another way to do it, the Schedule A is better, whatever, I'm willing to amend my, you know, amend it in another meeting. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quinn and everybody, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Thanks, Tom, for all your continued work. Oh, I'm sure. I don't know about that, Tom. Tom, we'll see you. <laughs> this coronavirus is serious. <laughs> Tom, I hope not. not. Not for this building, anyway. <laughs> okay we are on item number four moving, along. moving right along <laughs> to hear consider and approve for delivery to the rtm the senior and disabled tax relief ordinance date recommendation from the Board of Finance Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Subcommittee. Can I have a motion to put this before us? Mr. Walsh, second by Mr. DeWitt. Just a little uh, background on this. So based on the opinion of the previous town attorney, it was determined that the Board, that the board of Finance has a role in updating the Senior Disabled Tax Relief Ordinance and then approving the ordinance and then sending it over to the RTM. So based on that, Mr. Flynn set up a committee, Mr. DeWitt chaired, Mrs. Marmion and Mr. Walsh were on that committee and they put in a lot of work. And there was a lot of help and, and feedback from RTM members and the public itself. So we appreciate this committee's work and the committee is ready to put this in front of our board now, to move this to the RTM, uh, we would have to vote on this and approve it, and then we would send it forth. So with that, Mr. Dewitt, again, thank you and your committee for the time you spent on this, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick administrative note, um, Mr. Murray, our tax assessor, was going to be here this evening, but he is sick. He's actually been out of work for a couple of days. Uh, and Mr. Bremer is here representing the First Select Woman's Office. Uh, there are two, there are two things in your package that was on your desk today. One is a color copy PowerPoint presentation called Board of Finance Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Committee. And the second one is a um, very official looking uh, couple pages that starts with, um, it's, it's actually our um, an ordinance, 95.7. Those are the two things I'm going to reference. They should be right behind. It should be right behind this presentation. So I'll start with the I'll start with the the PowerPoint presentation. Go through that quickly, and then we'll I'll walk you through um, with um, Ms. Marmy and Mr. Walsh's help if needed. What exactly the changes are we're recommending? Because the 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 document this word document that's um, starts with 95.7 uh, is the actual recommendation. 
But the PowerPoint um, is intended to give an overall um, flavor of what, this, of what these words mean, right? Because nowhere in the ordinance does it say this cost the town X number of dollars. That, that, that impact has been um, determined by the tax assessor. So if you go to that PowerPoint. So really quickly, the goals of our committee were to maximize the number of seniors that can take advantage of this, this great tax relief. We're already number three in the state. We already have a good tax relief, but we wanted to maximize how many people can take advantage. We also wanted to make sure that we maximize the benefits for the lowest income seniors. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, next couple charts, but there's a, there's a range of, um, of income levels. And when we originally looked at the RTM proposal last time, they were proportionally giving a, a percentage increase to all the levels. And we said, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you're giving 5% to someone who's making $65,000 and 5% to someone who's making $15,000. That, that doesn't benefit the most needy, which is the lowest income. And we, we wanted to maximize those benefits. And then, listen, we wanted to keep this at an acceptable level. And I guess acceptable level is a, you know, <laughs> it can vary between who, who's speaking about it, right, is Mr. Brummer shaking his head. So next, next chart. So how did we do this? So the committee, we, we, it was a lot of meetings. Uh, we interviewed, we went to the senior center twice we had lunch with everybody one day. We went to an evening meeting, so we caught different groups. We had literally had um, questionnaires that we prepared, we went and talked to people. We found a lot of people who are taking advantage of the tax relief today, which is really great. We heard a lot of people that say, I've never heard of this thing, which hopefully made them aware of it. We had meetings with the Fairfield Senior Advocates. They were at, I think, every one of our meetings. Um, the RTM representative, uh, Representative Vergara, was at all, if uh, some, if not all of our meetings. We met with the tax assessor a lot, especially me. He's probably sick of hearing from me. And we did meet with the, um, the former CFO, Mr. Mayor, um, on, a, on this and the financial impacts that, that it had on the town. We created some new tools. We won't deal with that. And then um, made sure that we had multiple scenarios that addressed all the stakeholders in town. Because even though this affects um, senior and disabled tax relief um, taxpayers, it affects all of us as taxpayers because we, we ultimately pay for this, right, as taxpayers. So the next chart. So a lot of numbers in the current state. If you opened up the ordinance today, you'd see this chart in there. There's really only two things I, I want you to take, three things to take away from this. There are 1,306, 1,306 households that are taking benefit from this program today. Of those 1,306, 109 uh, participants are getting the maximum benefit. So what does that mean? That means, you know, by, um, I think it's a state, state mandate, you have to pay at least 25% of your taxes. You can't get 100% tax relief. So those 109 people are getting 75% of their taxes paid. That's what that means. And right at the bottom, that's the number that's in the budget today, $3.37 million, roughly. Next chart. Benefits are making a difference. This is today, right? So if you look at the bottom, that there's, there's two blocks, right? And you'll see it says payment percentage before credits. So if the, if the Fairfield uh, Senior and Disabled Tax Relief did not exist, so if you look at the top, it says home assessments, 200000 250 that's how much your house is assessed at as a taxpayer. And then the vertical income is the range, 0 to 18100 That's how That's your income level. So, for example, if you own a home, that is assessed at $250,000, and you make between zero and $18,100 today, if, if this credit program did not exist, 49% of your income, that yellow box of 49%, would be how much you would pay in taxes, 49%. Now go to the box on top. After the existing credits, these are today, before this change I'm talking about, that same person with a $250,000 home assessment making between zero and 18,000 only pays 16%. So it's a 33%, in this one particular regard, 
it's a 33% um, decrease, in, percentage-wise, again, of income of how much they pay. It's, it's significant. So it's, it's working today, and it's working for that $3.37 million that we pay for it. So next chart. So here are our changes. And again, I don't, there's three things I want you to look at. There's still 1,306 households that are taking benefit. But now with these changes, and all we've changed are the percentage of taxes and the dollars. The dollars are the cap, right? Now 230 households will participate and get maximum benefits. And that new price tag is $3.8 million. So we've gone up 400 and some odd thousand dollars. So for that $400,000, if you look at the next chart, oh, that's two charts from now. Go to two charts from now if you just, for a conclusion, yes, we're going to back up a chart, sorry. So for a 13% tax burden increase, we increased the participants by 111%. So for 13% tax increase, we go from 109 pe people taking maximum benefit to 230 people taking maximum benefit. And by the way, those people are in the lowest tax, the, the lowest income levels, which is the reason why our committee thought that this was a good idea. Go back a chart and you'll see the same kind of chart before. So the top box is the current state. So again, if you have a house that's assessed at $250,000 and you're in that upper income level, says average income 13,689, that's the 0 to 18,000 range, right? Today, you're paying 16% of your overall income to to um to pay your taxes. After this change, when it's made, you go to the bottom that same person is, is paying 12 percent and where we've even though we've really maximized the changes across all the income levels right up to um, the household assets up to six hundred thousand dollars you can see from the top to the bottom all the numbers do get lower but we really focused on where that blue box is at the four lowest income levels and it starts evening out because um, after the, the bottom three, we, we want those are staying the same because, again, they're the highest income. They're the three highest income um, levels in the, in the town. We wanted to focus on the four lowest level. So that, that is pretty much that, and we'll talk about next steps. So that's the, that's the, the high-level overview with the, with the real dollars and cents. So $3.37 million today turns into $3.8 million in the budget we're going to start talking about on Monday. Yes, Ms. Marmion. And exactly to that point, can Mr. Bremer come up and just tell us if that $400,000 increase or decrease in revenue essentially to the town is budgeted for? Mr. Bremer would love to do that. Marmion, this is something on our committee we talked about, and we were represented that the first select woman had put in $400,000 into the budget and we have our budget books. Ms. Bossy, can you tell us where in the budget book senior tax relief is? I thought it was a deduction from no, revenue. No, it's a revenue, right? Is it an expense or a revenue of side? Revenue. It's side. revenue. So where? Well, it's credit, right? It's on page three in, in the credit. I believe it's a credit on the revenue side. Correct. Yeah, that's where it normally is. Uh, so they, they it's said page, page three, three. Page three in the actual book. I don't know if it's on the errata sheets or not, but three? It says three at the bottom. So it's on here. And so it's in that total credit number. Where's the credit number? What numbers are you looking at? So, Mr. Boss, are you saying the total credit? 198. 
Okay, so that's the total credits, 419896. And what was it? No, it's the 21 number is 4550066 in the so 21 what's budget. So what's the difference? How much? That's only $351,000 change. And we were told at, Chris, that the first select woman had asked, had put in, and you said you were told this by Mr. Bremer, so we'll ask him to talk about it, that he, you got a call from him saying that you were, that the first select woman had agreed to put in $400,000. So, Mr. Bremer, why don't you talk about that and how now that number is 351000 It's 351000 uh, Well, we did add 400000 to the budget. The reason is not 400000 on that line is because the amount that we're crediting every year is shrinking. The class of people in the past, the senior class is shrinking. So from one year to the next, the number has decreased, and we added 400000 to it. So it only appears as if it's grown by 350 whatever it is. But the fact is we put 400000 in because the number decreased from the previous year. It's, it's, the, it's the difference between the budgeted number and the actual, right? The budgeted was 337, correct. and the actual came in $500,000 less or whatever that That's number correct. Not 500000 sorry. Yeah. It's like $15,000 less, right? No, oh, 50000 sorry. What, what you're saying is the actual for this budget is $50,000 less than what, what the budget was. Is that what we're saying? I'm saying that the actual is less than the budget was in 2020, right? So they used the, I think it was the three-year actual number. Am I, yeah, am I right with that? that's right. And then we added 400000 onto that. Okay. So it's so on the actual, not the budget. Does everyone understand that? It's that 4550066 is the actual budget number that has the 400 in it. It looks like a 350 change because they budgeted on the average of the last three years, and we added 400 to that. Right. Okay. So, in effect, the amount that we're actually spending, is actually spending, is decreasing, has right. decreased. Right. Right. So, I, I was asked 400 and something. Off the so I put 400 in. Got it. And that whole line in the budget is for senior tax relief, correct? I think there's another say, small I'm credit sorry, number. You're right. There. I think there's other, there's other things in the line as well. What's the three, breakout three of that? I'm just well, not sure. I don't know. I can get that to you tomorrow. I know Linda has it. It's, it's, there's another credit in there. I just don't remember what it's called. Okay. If you can get that to us and also have the breakout compared to last year so we could see that it was basically sure. somewhat close to full, full Well, we're still 000. in the 20 year, so that's not going to be over yet. That's a budget number, mm -hmm. and we're still in the 20 year. So okay. it would be the average of the prior three years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll be happy to get that for you. And why is the total but change 8.36% when your calculation of what we were doing by adding approximately 400, it's $430,000 under this plan um, is 13%. The actual, the actual change here from what it was before last, what it was last year, Chris, I just calculated it. it's 437,525. And we have it listed there, uh, the change in the potential burden to the taxpayers being an increase to th by 13%. But when we look at it in the budget book, even with the other things, it's a change of 8.36. Are the other budgeted credits going down substantially? Is that Ms. Bossy, do you know that? Or well, not? again, I think it's, it's we, I got to look to see what the other credit number is in there, and then we'll, it, it'll all work out in terms of what the other one is, what it was based on. Yeah, but technically, I mean, looking at it math-wise, if the change to Mr. DeWitt calculated is 13%, then the other credits had to have gone down substantially for the entire line to only be a change of 836 and Chris, your number is based on budget as well, not actual, or? My 13% is based on the budget, yes. 20 to 21. Mm hmm Okay. All right. I guess we'll take a look at these pages. We'll have time to talk about it during the budget as well, but there's definitely. I know. could have Linda send you follow-up tomorrow morning. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You. 
so there's um so that's that's kind of the 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 overview if you will now um the the word document that's associated with it this is um this is our actual if if approved tonight our actual recommendation to changes to the ordinance now just so we're all clear Board of Finance doesn't write ordinance because we're not the legislative branch, right? So, so we have to. We will make a recommendation to the um, to the senior. Uh, well, I guess I'll make a recommendation on behalf of our committee or our board now after tonight. It'll go through L and A, and then it'll go through the whole body of of the RTM. So, um, my my apologies for this not being printed in color. But if you go to the second page, I'll just run you through. I, I won't take you through in painful detail the, the words that were added, but I, um, unless you really want to. But if you look on the second page under paragraph starting with five, you'll see kind of a grade area. Um, one of the one of the big uh, misses that uh, Mr. Walsh had, had had thought about was you know we were never accounting for trusts in this in this uh, senior and disabled tax relief. So there's a couple sections you'll see in here where um, Mr. Walsh went out and looked at different, uh, different communities and added languages, uh, land, added language, very specific to making sure that now people will, be, will have to include trusts in the calculation of their income. And this particular grade area in paragraph five is, is the first one. Go ahead. Please. So I just need a point of clarification, and this has come up. The trust language, when you submit your, your tax returns, you have a, I don't, I don't know if it's called a supplement, it's like a K-1 or something where you list your trust, right? So it's there for people to see. I'm not, no, I'm just asking the question because I know that that's a part of your tax return. So the language that, that we've added here, would we view it as a reinforcement of the need to disclose trust because they will be disclosing trust, right? I just need that clarified. Well, I think it was I think it was not only trust income, but it was also expenses that a trust may pay on your behalf because this all as you you, know, you were there at the meetings came up because Mr. Murray was unable to explain and he's the one who raised it, the fact that we have people who are part of the senior tax relief right now who have twelve thousand dollars of taxes and like eight eight thousand dollars of income and he doesn't understand how that's possible now somebody could have a lot of savings i guess a lot of, a lot of savings but if you did have those kind of savings so you you'd, you'd be probably disqualified from the the senior tax relief to begin with so we started thinking about how that could happen well certainly a trust could pay your taxes uh, your trust could pay lots of expenses and we did not want to have a situation where we had millionaires basically who were funded by a trust for expenses and possibly income who were qualifying for senior tax relief and that's why we added the language so again, I just have a question, and again, I'm just asking the question because do you, when you're submitting your your income and your your tax returns, your trust information should be there. Is that correct? I mean, how could we not? I'm not a tax maybe, expert, but maybe I mean. Mary could, because I the question has come up: Is this? So the answer is yes and no. It depends on what type of trust you have. Um, so you could have a trust that is considered a grantor trust that will pass through all income and expense it pays directly to you. Um, you could also have a trust that um, doesn't make distributions but pays expenses on your behalf and so it could make distributions to you. Um, so that that's a factor. It's not considered income or expense but it's still a, a distribution um, a principle to you. Um, so there's different ways to look at that. Um, I don't know how to give you a, it's a complicated answer. <laughs> um. So the answer is yes and no. 
Well, I, I, I think the answer is just filing your, your tax return doesn't, doesn't quite give you the whole picture on your trusts. And that's or the, my, or the that income, was my, or the income that you could be receiving from your trust. And that's right? why the language yeah. is there, because that was confusing to me. Like, if don't right. you get that full picture in your tax return? But perhaps you don't necessarily. So this is just reinforcing. Yes. And we were kind of trying that. to also yeah. follow the state program where people can get certain credits from the state for seniors, um, for um, and disabled, um, and they had added that into their description of of the documents and 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 the calculation of income to their own forms so we just thought we should follow it Good. and that language makes sense but how does the town if that if those expenses are not passed through as income on one's tax return how do we know whether uh, you know a, a, a person who we believe qualifies is is actually in, you know accounting for that or not? I mean, we have it in here, but is there any enforcement mechanism? The enforcement mechanism is that we'll get we'll get to it in a little bit. But the enforcement mechanism makes you make a representation about it and 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 makes you make it under oath, subject to fraud. And, gotcha. And we also are putting in, and I will gladly. Um, um, listen to, um, we, we're also going to require that a certain percentage of these be audited on a yearly basis. I guessed 3%. I'm less willing to listen to our accounts and auditors um, who are members of this board to tell me whether that's too high or too low. I just wanted to put a number in there. So when we come to that, maybe we could have that discussion. But we wanted there to be an enforcement issue. And if, and if we end up getting trust documents, um, we, we do say that, you'll see that later on, what documents you have to supply. We ask for trust documents that you have to supply. If you don't properly represent it, and Mr. Murray, or we could even have the internal auditor, that's another discussion we're gonna be bringing up before the body tonight, um, believes that you haven't properly represented and it's been fraudulent, they would refer to the police department for investigation. Thank you. Stop reading ahead, Lori, all right? <laughs> I said stop reading ahead. <laughs> no, page three under uh, section 95-9A. Uh, You'll see the first grayed out area is just a clarification. Um, uh, Mr. Walsh thought, and I think we all agreed that it, it said before you have to give your tax return. No, we're going to tell you you have to have an IRS 4506 and a 460 whatever with your taxpayer address on it, which is very important because if you read through some of the language that doesn't change here, you have to be a resident, obviously, and you have to live here X number of days out of the year. So if you file your tax return and it's, you know, Vero Beach, Florida, hey, guess what? You don't get senior tax relief in Fairfield, Connecticut. And that wasn't in there before. The next grade area is uh, further explanation of the trust documents. And then right near the end of that paragraph is that is what um, Mr. Walsh just alluded to. Uh, the applicant or his or her authorized agent shall sign a sworn affidavit, which was in there before. Now it says under penalty of perjury in the presence of the uh, assessor. So there was a form that everyone filled out, but it was basically you're, you're kind of on your honor. Now we're making that a little more. And, and I just want to bring up, there, was some, there were some concerns raised from the public. I mean, these are complicated forms. You're swearing to something. You're, you know, you're under oath. And, and there was some concern with se some seniors. This might be confusing. So it's a little, it might be a little scary. We don't want it to present a barrier to people in terms of you know, applying for senior and disabled tax relief. But we did feel it was important to be in here so that we got the real information, but I am concerned. Uh, I, I do think this we this is a process. We need to look at how this goes and make sure that it does not become a barrier or that people are confused by the process or put off by it or don't know what they're signing. So there are a lot of issues uh, with adding this. Yeah. So it's a process. We felt the need to protect the taxpayer that people weren't fraudulently, um, especially with some of the instances that Mr. Murray was talking to us about, like the one I mentioned already to protect the taxpayers' dollars. Um, 
I don't think any of the things we put in are, are uncommon to anybody filing for a common mortgage. Um, actually, the common mortgage documents actually require more things and talk about a lot more stricter things that would happen to you if you were to fraudulently file um, documents, income information, expense information, you know, things like that. So it's kind of more to bring it in line with today um, and modernize it and um, to have some check and balance on it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if it scares people, but, you know, it also scares me that we could have people taking money from a system um, uh, that, you know, we're giving three, potentially $3.8 million to people, a pool of money, um, which is a, going up by 13% in a given year um, at, you know, a time that, you know, we're stressed in our budget to begin with to, uh, that, that I think checks and balances were necessary. And there's check and balances in other towns. These are not unsimilar. And some of this language, to be quite honest with you, I plagiarized out of Westports and some other towns that I looked at. So this is not like new language um, or stuff that I can purely say was my authorship, so. Yep, that's a fair point. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I just want to dovetail off of what Mr. Walsh was just saying and to kind of address your point. We have a senior center um, that Mr. Marco heads up that is respon partially responsible for helping seniors that have questions about this type of thing. And certainly I'm sure we could address concerns on the website and perhaps in the communication process of this new ordinance, whether it's through this board or the RTM or whatever, to communicate to the seniors and disabled, whoever may take advantage of this program, that there is help available to people who may have questions or may get confused. So I think some of your concerns are certainly valid, but they could be easily addressed, I guess is my point. I, again, I would say this is a process. I'm interested to see how it plays out. Um, I think our senior center does a great job advocating for our seniors and helping them understand the process. But there are people who will fall through the cracks. They will go down. They'll fill out these forms. They may not have the full understanding. They may not have an advocate, a family member, a friend next to them to explain this. So I'm just saying, let's see how this goes. Um, but I would hate for barriers to be put up for people. Um, again, we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Thanks. Just a quick question. Do they ha do the taxpayers have to go down to town hall to apply? Yes. Like half of them go one year. It's all based on um, uh, every two-year two rotations. So, so but, doesn't but, that present a barrier to our oldest seniors? Well, it's every two years. Um, so you do get a kind of a free ride on one year. So it's not, you know, and, and things change, you know. and you know, at some point, you know, I think that the, uh, I think that Mr. Murray's group does go down to the senior center yeah. and helps the people there who seem to be sometimes some of the most needy. Um, and I, and I've also been told they actually search out for people who are not um, reapplying. They actually try to search them out on why they're not reapplying. And they'll actually go to people's houses to help them do it if they need them to do that. Yeah, I was I was actually going to clarify Mr. Testani's statement that the senior center helps helps the seniors fill out the forms. They actually facilitate by having a place for the the seniors, you know, to get them there. But Mr. Murray's group literally goes there and fills it out with them. So it's not the senior center personnel; it's literally Mr. Murray and his and his office. And I think they can file from there. They can, yeah. And just to, I mean, this this whole process has been. Uh, I think seniors, we're not necessarily reaching all of the eligible seniors. That's an issue. Yep. That's not our issue on this subcommittee, but it is an issue that might need to be addressed, and we discuss that. Yep. I mean, there are a lot of, um, are we reaching everybody? Maybe not. Are they able to get down to the senior center? Maybe not. Are they accessing a website? Do they have, you know, a, you know, a computer in their home? I mean, there are a lot of things. That's not what we really focused on, but it, it it still bears uh, study and needs to be addressed. I will say I was amazed by the effort they put in to try to find people. 
and especially people who have fallen off. And they've, they've bought lists they've, of seniors in town. They do all sorts of stuff. So I was actually quite impressed by the effort that they put in to try to get to as many seniors as possible. It wasn't anything I was expecting them to say. Um, so um, not that more can't be done. We talked in our committee about maybe talking to Mr. Murray and having in you know one of the tax bills that comes having notification on the back of it or a slip of paper like Mr. Tetro used to put in some brightly colored thing or, you know or, or or to send out a notification and pay for a mailing one mailing or something right before in the tax when that senior tax relief and disabled tax relief um, period is about to begin the application process yeah and I don't want to belabor this point too much, but yeah, we spent a lot of time <laughs> talking about this. And the Fairfield Senior Advocates, the Fairfield Taxpayer, uh, a lot of organizations are worried that you know we're not reaching everybody. Well, um, we we've come to the conclusion that this is this is just baby steps, right? So we'll do this for a year, and then you know we think there's going to be 230 people in the program, and if we only get five more people. Well, maybe we need to, you know, figure out what happened here. If we get more than that, well, then we, we may have missed something, right? So it's a little bit of a calibration. And, and again, we could have spent another three years trying trying to make this all right from every aspect. But, but we wanted to make sure that we did this as soon as possible to give, again, the most benefit to the most needy individuals. But we'll, we'll have to track it for, for sure. Um, we're still on page three. Sorry, this doesn't have a um, page number. Under uh, C, there's a, the, the grayed out text. Uh, this is what Mr. Walsh was alluding to before about the, uh, this whole paragraph is about the fact that you have to have an affidavit today. We added the language that in order to prevent the filing of fraudulent applications, the, oh, little filed twice. The tax assessor shall randomly audit 3%. No, we, we came up with 3%. We were actually going to ask Mr. Murray about that tonight. I asked him by email, but he, he didn't respond. Um, but needless to say, we think there needs to be an audit of these things. I don't think there is an audit in place today, and if it is, it's, it's ad hoc. And then at the end, any suspected fraud will be filed with the Fairfield Police. Now, one other thing I just want to make sure it was clear, uh, when Ms. Marmion was saying, you know, people were objecting, oh, this is, you know, now we're talking about you know, getting people, putting people in jail, and, and, and um, that was actually not raised by any seniors. And one of the, and, and um, we have to remember that there's also a, um, uh, back to the last point, there's also, a, there's a disabled component to this too, so we have to realize, we have to reach out to those people too. So if Mr. Murray's okay with doing the audits, you're just uh, not sure if the 3 percent is the right number? Yeah, we, we had talked about it in committee one time about audits, and he agreed, yes, we, we need to do them. The 3 percent number, yeah. Now, uh, I was also going to say that, you know, this is going to go through review at LNA, at RTM, and the actual L in, in the LNA, uh, sorry, the actual RTM body. So if there's a couple word tweak here and there, I mean, I think we can, we can also tweak the document there. Yeah, I mean, it goes to one review, sits in the LNA for two months, then it goes to the body. And I think that's an important point because timing is very important. Uh, this needs to get to the RTM to go through LNA, and then they may make changes. I mean, we're only making recommendations. They, this is really their ordinance. They can make changes. LNA looks at it again, and then, um, and then it goes up for a vote. So I was going to ask this question near the end of our presentation, but since it's been brought up right now, um, so the RTM could totally change this whole thing, right? What, what's the, just Chris? What's well, the so I what's let me. The what if so they do something? Change the, it uh, when Does it come um, back to us again. When the former town attorney, uh, attorney Lesser, gave me opinion because we started, that was his opinion. Um, I've I've asked the current town attorney. And his interpretation is different. His interpretation, and, and he he was going to uh, send me his interpretation. I, I don't I don't have it for this evening's meeting, but uh, his interpretation is that this is a recommendation by the board of finance, and that um, the RTM is perfectly um, perfectly able to 
play around with a word here and there or or actually even possibly reduce the amount of funding. You know, it's like it's almost like a budget. We send them a four hundred million dollar budget and they cut out five hundred thousand of contingency. Oh well, they've cut they've cut the budget. You know, we don't we don't have a say after that. Um, but I don't have that final opinion. It just suffices to say that uh, uh, Mr. Baldwin doesn't agree with the the interpretation of Mr. Attorney Lesser. The next page. Hey, can we stop right there for a second? Oh, sure. Um, to the people on our board who have, or in the, in, or who are in the crowd, um, and maybe even one of our selectmen or. Um, or our chief administrative officer. Um, what do people think about 3%? I mean, 3% round numbers is like for almost 40, 39 audits for what we're talking about. Uh, you know, two, I, I mean, I could be sold on something. You, the numbers are simple. They go based, basically, there's 1,300 people on it. It's 13 per percentage. So it's either 13, 26, 39. I don't know what standard in the accounting and uh, auditing field, but we said we'd talk about it tonight here, knowing that we have some expertise at the table. And Mr. Bates, and I forgot your CPA as that, well. To me, yep. that sounds like a lot. A lot. That sounds like a lot. I, I wouldn't, uh, I, yeah, 40, 30, 40 applications? That's a lot. I mean, you're gonna be corresponding with the IRS to get their 4506 or whatever yep. that is, matching that stuff up. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a long, lengthy process. I anticipate if we go the three percent route, we're going to hear from Ross Murray next year. I need more. I need more help. Well, that's the, what I would expect. Well, that's interesting well, because I, I was also, I'm the one who wrote it that portion. So I, I'm also willing to say that it can be um, either his department or the internal auditor. Uh, either one. So if Mr. Murray was busy or needed some assistance or only wanted to do half of them, it could be either one. Um, that's kind of that's the other issue I'd, I'd want to talk about in that sentence. Well, the only the only comment I have to that is you all that data that you just said, the, the 36 or whatever you said, five, that that data has already been provided. If you want to go to get senior tax relief and your year's up, you have to provide all that data. So you don't yeah. have to go to the IRS to get it. Yeah, but also, too, they've submitted that information. Yep. But in an audit, what Murray's going to do is submit the 4506s. The 4506 the to the IRS to make sure that what they filed matches up with what they gave us. Yes. He'll get the transcripts oh, back. Oh, I understand. Yes. Okay. And this is what every okay, mortgage, you. anytime you sign a mortgage, you sign these things. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, I mean, 3%, you know, if he, you know, 3%, 2%, I, I think maybe what might um, make more sense is maybe to use some judgment. You um, identified a situation where a taxpayer paid a significant amount in ta uh, paid an amount in taxes that was significantly higher than the income they stated. So that's a red flag. And so maybe there's a, you know, a protocol where, you know, uh, the tax assessor can use some judgment or the internal auditor, if they do it, uses some judgment to maybe identify some applications that. Are, are there standard sampling amounts that in auditing that people yeah, use? Yeah, no, well, I mean, you know, you could, you could pick 25, you could pick 50. You could pick, it does, I don't think it matters as much as, what matters more is what are you trying to accomplish? So if you're looking for fraud, I think you would look for red flags or risk and pick those and then maybe just pick a few other randomly and you'd probably get a better result than just picking, you know, 3% randomly out of all of them. Um, well, that, it, it seems to me that the situation you're describing is what we're concerned about where we have individuals who, you know, are not, okay. you know. So that raises the next question because you said that you think that he should be able to pick ones that he flags and also do some randomly and I had put in the word randomly because I didn't want somebody to say that they were specifically targeted. So I was saying randomly, but you're right. I didn't think about this, that if he sees some that he thinks, um, so maybe we should put in a certain number, like 20 or 25, you know, you know, something like that. Jim, 20. I got a suggestion. Why don't we leave it up to Ross and build in some uh, 
some words here. The, the tax assessor shall, shall have the right to randomly audit up to 3%. So in other words, he can, we give him some wiggle room to establish some discretion on what they want to look at. So in other words, let's say he only wants to do 1% of them, finds no issues, then there's no reason to go up to 3%. If he does 1% and he focuses on some areas that he thinks might be suspect, and generates a you know a hot return, then he can go. Okay, I'm going to go up to the three percent. I think I might have a filing issue here. So, so you're okay leaving it to the assessor. I mean, we're I'm not never, doing, we're not I'm doing never it today. In, so I mean, yeah, I'm never know. in favor of micromanaging the departments to that yeah, degree. Yeah, I like yeah. to build in verbiage that gives them the latitude to do what they need to do to enforce it. But I'm not going to want to hear him come back and we ask him a question and said that he did one, or he did zero because it says up to. I, I, I want to know at least there's going to be some that are done, especially some that are randomly done, because it's the no, you're right. It's the if, randomness if we leave it part. To that, he could do zero. It's the randomness part. The randomness part that people who are reading how they do this are like, oh crap, I'm gonna, I might just be pulled. <laughs> okay, Mr. Flynn. I, you got to hold it now. It's, New technology, new for me. Um, Tom Flynn, Board of Selectmen. Um, the only problem I have with saying up till 3%, if you, if you get, um, and, and I just throw it out there, if you get a local accountant or someone like that who figures out how to work the system, right, they can actually get a bunch of people that are doing whatever you don't want them to do on these forms, right? And so if you stop at 3% and say you're capped at 3%, what if they're at 4%, you know, what are 4% of them or 5% of them? I think as you, as you would say, and, and Mr. Bates and, and Mrs. LeClaire, if you start doing an audit and you find errors, you actually expand your scope, you don't lower your scope. So if you found that 1% had issues, you might in that given year start looking at a 5% sample or a 6% sample, I'm not saying you know, definitively, but when you find errors, you expand scope, not stop at a certain, so I wouldn't put a cap, but I would certainly put a floor and say you need to look at a certain number. That, thank you for the time, Mr. Thanks. Chair. Thanks. Mrs. Leclerc. So Tom hit upon exactly what I was gonna say. I was gonna say put a minimum amount and at the discretion of the tax assessor. All right, thank so you. you want him maybe to he's got he's got to audit ten per year, but have language in there that says um, randomly audit at least ten applications a year, but at his discretion may audit more, something like that, language like that, just to give him. Do we even need to say if we say. Then, I don't. See, I don't I, think you have to see, say low. with the right to <laughs> do more. I think he has the right. Okay. So yeah, what are you going right. to? What about? Yeah, 20? you're right. He can do it anyway, John. If I, I think, I think you're on the right track going with the floor. Right. I, I like that. So if we say he has to look at ten applications now, if, if he starts seeing issues, he can go wherever he wants. So I think it should be a minimum. I'm going to su suggest that it should be a minimum of fifteen because that's at least over one percent. <laughs> um, so at least 15 percent. So a 15 um, quantity. 15, I'm sorry, 15. Right. So the tax assessor shall randomly audit. And then I want to add the words, but I want to take out randomly where it's currently is. Okay. And put, um, and some shall be randomly done. So you so want to say he has to do some randomly, and some he could do targeted because this that way it gives him the ability to do some random. Or he can do 15 random, and also, if he sees any red flags, he can pick those additionally. I mean, generally, you always try to kind of profile what you're looking at and pick the things that don't look right. Um, that's a more effective way of doing it. So 15 random, 1% is fine. And then, you know, if he should happen to identify some others that don't make sense, or perhaps it's a new one and it, it doesn't look right, um, or the application has changed significantly from the last time in terms of, you know, the income, just something that doesn't look right, he can certainly pick those. And hopefully there won't be a lot of them, but I think that's probably the right way to do it. Right, so give me the words. 
Okay, so we're going to say, um, so randomly audit will stay in. Um, at least right after the word audit, we're going to cross out 3% and put in at least 15 of the applications a year, comma, but may audit more of the applications at the tax assessor's discretion, comma. Yes. One other thought. Um, we said the tax assessor, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but maybe the tax assessor or a designee. So if Internal Audit wanted to do this, they could do it instead of the tax assessor? Okay, great. So we're going to change the language to say the tax assessor or a designee shall randomly audit at least 15 of the applications a year, but may audit more applications, more applications at the discretion of the tax assessor, at the tax assessor's discretion, comma, including getting the tax transcripts and all the rest. Okay. We'll make that change. Uh, next page. 95-11, um, the, the current document says there's, there's a cap. So senior tax relief, senior and disabled tax relief cannot go above 2.5% of the total real property value levied in Fairfield. There was an additional uh, language added, but we'll probably have a debate for debate tonight. Or what is budgeted in the municipal year in which the credit will be used against real property estate taxes do. So, for example, um, we're asking for, we're, we think the budget is $3.8 million this year. So now there would be two restrictions, 2.5% of total uh, real estate, but the real limitation would be what was budgeted for that year. Now, just as a data point, um, we've never gone above the budget, ever. Um, and I looked way back. Now, um, in fact, up until four-ish years ago, and when Mr. Murray really put in some real math, we were significantly overfunding it and giving back like three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars. It was it was not close. It now this year it's pretty close. It's like within you know tens of thousands of dollars, right? Before it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. So and any thoughts on that? I mean, the, the worst case scenario would be if it did go over 3.8, then, then, <laughs> then yeah. what do you do? Right? Yeah, I, I put that in there just as a safeguard against the budget so that no matter what happened with the budget, we couldn't go over that a budgeted amount. You're saying the 2.5 is the safeguard? Now, the 2.5 was put That's in there, language, to be quite right? honest with you. That 2.5 was put in there by um, previously – when um, Representative Figuera's group wanted to make some substantial changes uh, to the ordinance where they took away QTAV. the QTAV and whatever. And Mr. Mayor raised, uh, I think wisely, didn't know what was going to happen. There, there was, there, it, we did not know where that number would go and how that would change senior tax relief. So it asked for there be some type of basic safety lever in there of this 2.5 percent. So now so being on the board of finance, when I look at it, it should be whatever is budgeted, <laughs> and we shouldn't go over that because if it goes over budget, and we go in the red on this thing for some reason, we either have to hopefully there's surplus, I guess that would take care of it. In that given year, we would could borrow for it, which I don't think we should ever do for this. But I just think that it should not go above whatever the, the, the amount that we budget for. Now let's talk about how the budgeting process would work. So I believe the first select person who was ever in the seat would have to budget for what they thought it was going to be every year. But just, and, I'm sorry, can I? 
Just logistically, though, you get a bunch of applications. We figure out that this is going to be over the budgeted amount. So then how does that work? It's just prorated. Is that specified in here? It says, in the event that either the foregoing limitations on relief is reached, relief shall be prorated among the qualified applicants. So prorated how? Meaning that, I, you know, we. That was, a, that was one of the big problems with the last proposal from the RTM. So if you go over, I'm making this up, you go over $500,000, do you equally take the same amount, percentage amount out of everyone's senior tax relief till you get the 500,000 or, so or, or what? Lower income brackets the same, I mean. Right. I question. think it's your, probably would be whatever percentage of the total money you were supposed to have, have received, like each individual taxpayer was supposed to receive whatever, right. and now you are, have a smaller pot, you get 97% of that money or whatever it is. It just it introduces a little bit of uncertainty for the applicant, so it may just be worthwhile to specify um, what yeah. it is, just so they know, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm reluctant to put too much detail behind that, to be to be honest with you. But this this was an addition, and, and we, we we did put it we did specifically vote this forward out of the committee. Be, to, to have a debate here, so, you know, I don't know if anyone feels strongly about it being in. I think it's a good idea. I mean, we've we've gone, I mean, as long as I've been on the board with, with oh, the number's a number, and we've been fortunate that every year it's been less than the budgeted number, but. It is starting to get close. Though. It's getting close, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a couple of years ago, this number was above $4 million every year. We never spent that much money, but it was it was a, it was budgeted above four million dollars. So, so you we need that two point five percent language still in there as a. As, why do we need that still? Well, if, I mean, if that's every the going to be budgeted. That's, that's the. I don't uh, personally. I don't believe we need that. You don't I mean two point five percent. I think it, I think I think actually we could probably stick with the language that we're adding, and it covers that. Situation. Because what if one year you have a first select person who doesn't budget it, then it's going to be 2.5% of the total real property tax levy, right? Uh, no, if you don't budget it, it's zero. Not it. But the way I read it, it says it's either the amount is 2.5% of the total real property tax levied in Fairfield in the preceding fiscal year or what is budgeted in the municipal year. So if you don't budget something, isn't the number the 2.5%? You know what? I, I meant to add. Oh. Which, uh, I meant to add whatever's less, to be honest with you, when I, when I went through Oh, that, that, that's so a I, fair I, point, I right? Yeah. I, I meant to put whatever's less. Now, not that it would be 2.5%. Yeah, so I. I thought we just wanted to append at the end um, real, real estate taxes due or, which, uh, let's say, so it can't be or and or. So 2.5% of the total real estate levied in the preceding fiscal year, comma, what is budgeted in the municipal year, remove that first or, or, oh no, or whichever is less. Why don't we just take out the 2.5% language? So the total tax relief granted under provisions of these programs shall not exceed what is budgeted in the municipal yes. year. Yes. So I'd like to make a motion to amend what's before us to um, take out after the word exceed um, an amount taking, removing an amount equal to 2.5% of the total real estate tax levied in Fairfield in the preceding fiscal year, comma, or. So it'll read not exceed what is budgeted in the municipal. Yep. Got it. Can I just ask a question? Where did we, who came up with the 2.5%? Do we know? Did I believe we? that was Mr. Mayor. Who did he, didn't he come up with another the old language, number, was it? Mr. So. DeWitt? I, for some reason, I thought he had given us a different perspective. I believe consider. this was in the old ordinance, but but um, I think I 
I believe the 2.5 percent was in the is in the current ordinance. Mr. Mayor had recommended when when the RTM was proposing that it be a different number. I think it was lower than 2.5 percent. I think it was lower. Because um, 2.5 percent is a big very, number. Very high. So. Yeah. I don't happen that's to have the, the other old consideration in front to go me, lower so. with that percentage. I mean, that's not. Again, I didn't know if it was Mr. Mayor or whom, whomever had given it to us. We're taking out the two and a half percent. Yep. And the, and right below that, there's also a um, a deferral, which is under um, a, a prayer. A, there's a tax deferral. God bless you. There's also a tax deferral um, thing, 1915B, uh, sorry, 9515B, which caps it at $500,000, but that should remain or whatever his budget is. Because 500000 is the, you know, it, that, that becomes applicable if the budget becomes $350,000, right? That's right. Whichever is less. I'm an engineer, so English isn't my strong suit. Okay. So moving on, the bottom of the page, there are um, today there are three programs. There's a tax freeze, there's a tax deferral, and there's a tax credit. Tax credit is what we talk about all the time, right? Tax freeze is under 9515A. No one takes advantage of this ever. Apparently, it's not a great deal. Uh, the RTM recommendation uh, was to remove this in its entirety. Our committee did the same thing, just to remove tax freeze. So you'll see from the bottom of this page through halfway to the next page, we're just removing tax freeze in its entirety. There are, apps, there are zero participants in the program today that that would affect. Um, skip to the next page. Sorry again. And this is the page that has the table called qualifying income. So that table should look familiar to you from my PowerPoint presentation. All of those numbers that are not crossed out and all the percentages that aren't crossed out and the caps, those are the new numbers that correlate to that $3.8 million number. So you'll see, just for, to make the point that I made earlier, um, under tax credit, if you're making fifty-six thousand to seventy-seven thousand three hundred dollars, your tax credit is going to be, is fifteen percent. Well, that's unchanged because we don't want to give we, we didn't want to give those that group of people any more tax relief. But yet you'll see up the top that the lowest range, which is zero to now sixteen thousand eight hundred, um, that credit has been increased from sixty-seven uh, percent to the maximum, which is 75%. So that, so that table, again, is if you look in the PowerPoint presentation, that's what makes that number generate a number of $3.8 million. You'll also notice on this page, um, in, under tax credit, there's a cross out. It's, gonna, it's going to become effective the tax year beginning October 1st, 2019, because it has to, to be effective this year. Uh, the qualifying income is as of 2019. It was never qualified before in the table, but it needs to be. And on the last page, because now, um, you know, Board of Finance has a role in this. Up until this year, Board of we never thought the Board of Finance had a role. So under 95.15.1, we added that the assessor now has to come to us every June, as well as the RTM, and give us a status of the tax relief program. And that's pretty much it. Uh, yes, Mr. B. That, <laughs> that requirement 
Is that going to change under the new town attorney's opinion? I, I mean, th this was oh, all the report. Yeah, this was all triggered by no. Stanton's opinion. Is no, no, no. The reporting, the reporting is not. That just that's the assessor coming to the RTM every year and saying, "Here's the status of the program." We we'll get the exact same briefing the RTM gets. We just because because we are now an inter well, we always had been an integral part. We just didn't know it, but because it was never required of the assessor to come to us, now it's just a requirement that he come to us. Okay, so. I think the answer to your question is no, it didn't have anything to do with what Mr. Having change. most of us in this room dealt with this stuff for years, we've always gone under every two years or every year, the RTM would form a tax relief committee and that would kick off this process. So now that we're involved, I think that the ordinance needs to be changed to reflect whose baby this is now at the bottom. So in other words, I don't, I don't know how to say this. Who's starting this process now? Right. Under the ordinance, the, the RTM is going to form a committee every year, and then we're going to get dragged into this. I think that we need to somehow clean up this process if it's guided by us and implemented by them. I think there this, has to be something where the assessor comes to us and says, Here's where you here's what you approved last year. Here's where we are at this stage. I'm thinking about the upcoming budget. This is where you need to be if you want to do this. So I'm recommending that you do this. I don't think we should mandate that we do this every year. I think it should be somehow the department head comes to us and says, this is where it is. If you want to increase tax relief, we didn't come nowhere near where we were. I think the program's not effective. Maybe we should up some percentages and have it start at that process, not we have to visit it. I, I don't know. Those are just my thoughts that I think we should clean this up now that we are a body that regulates it, which, right. quite frankly, I never thought we were. So, uh, fair point. Um, Attorney Lesser and Attorney Baldwin do both agree on a couple of points, and one of the points is that the charter does say that the Board of Finance has to start this process. We just haven't been following the charter all these years. So when I asked the same question, because that, that RTM re review committee, I, I'm with you. I don't think that the RTM should have to form a committee every year. It doesn't make any sense any longer. But there should be, it, uh, and apparently the charter covers it, that when the Board of Finance wants to start the cha change of the process, the Board of Finance initiates a committee that then re then reports out through the RTM committee. Now, how you coordinate that, I guess, is one of the things that we hadn't. And that's, you know. I think, we, we had a lot of discussion about this because yeah. we took Mr. Lesser's uh, opinion, and which was simply that we make a recommendation. And frankly, the recommendation could be as in-depth or it, it could simply be, you know, here's your cap in terms of money. Right. But we took it a little further than that. The issue for us was that the RTM committee had already done quite a lot of work and come before this body and presented, and then that triggered a question about the charter. And then we looked at what they had done, but we obviously made some changes. Within our committee, we discussed it would make more sense if we meet together uh, in concert and to go through this so that we're not doubling the work or reinventing the wheel. Um, and so one of the lessons learned we need to go through this and kind of right we were going to meet as a committee again and say what are the lessons learned from this process and how do we smooth this process out because it it, it was a repetitive process it was necessary because it was the first time that we had done it but it it, it should we should probably sit together on the same committee um and go through it so i know what ed's saying mr Bates is saying I think you leave 95, 14, 15.4 alone. The RTM is going to do what they want to do. I think maybe our authority is under the charter. Maybe we, some trigger every two years at one of our designated meetings, this topic's on the agenda and we can vote on forming a committee to look at it. 
so, something like that. I mean, I don't know if we need to put anything in the ordinance about us because yeah. it's already in the charter, right? Yeah, it, it is. I just it, we're it, not it, in the it charter. Sounds we're, like this, we're under state law. Yeah, it just yeah. sounds like this ordinance. No, charter, no, no, no. no. It sounds like the all the investigation rule. that you guys have done, it turns out that tax relief really belongs at this body. Yeah, and that's by and statute. And I'm thinking somehow this ordinance is, it goes against when it. I read it, it says the RTM, and quite frankly, from what I've heard tonight and what I've read, the RTM really doesn't have a lot to do with it. I think So I think that we, I think, Chris, when you go to the RTM, you should recommend to them to 95-15.4 is irrelevant. The, the, the issue is that a, there's a statute in the state of Connecticut that states that if there's going to be senior tax relief, it's allowed in a municipality only upon the recommendation of the Board of Finance of the town. Now, what's the question is, is what's the interpretation of the word recommendation? I didn't agree with Mr. Lesser's opinion that it means we give any type of recommendation being zero, being, um, you know, we just give bullet points or whether we write the statute or they tell them exactly what has to be in there. But, but Mr. Lesser says, oh, yes, once you give your recommendation, they don't have to follow it. I don't, my reading of it and the legislative history, the reason it comes to the Board of Finance is whether a town can afford it. That's what it's about. And the legislative body was not given that authority. It was given to the Board of Finance. That's to be decided at a later point at this point in time. But it can't get to the RTM without a recommendation. They can do all the work in the world. Yeah. And we just if sit we back don't recommend and do it, then right. Which is basically what just happened, right? What so I do think is I do have a problem with 95, 15.4 in that. I don't think this is something that should be done every year. You don't get enough data. And I think that at least that part should be changed. But I think that this body should get a Mr. Murray to come before us once a year, maybe at our capital planning meeting, to talk about what had happened that year. How many participants, what it is, did this work, could it be tweaked, what's his recommendation, to power the audits work, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, that, that, I like that. Yeah, that that sounds logical that it should emanate from there and then we build upon that. Yeah, but I yeah. think that I think it's odd because I think there's pressure on an RTM who's having to run pretty frequently to always want to better the tax relief. OK, so I think it's I don't think it should be done more than once every two years, once a term of the RTM. Um, but it still need our. So. But I do think there should be buy-in from the RTM versus, do you know what I mean? They yes. should they should come along with us on the process so that we're not selling it in and then having them raise points. We should be at the table together so that when they do bring it to the RTM, there's buy-in there and there's support and there's understanding uh, for, 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 or rationale for why decisions have been made. I think that's part of the issue is that we don't want to kind of, we want to work together on this so that we're all aligned and so that it'll get through the RTM easily. That's my point, really. All right, let me just go to Mr. Testani real quick. Jack? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. All I was going to suggest to um, dovetail off of Mr. Walsh's comments is maybe we just add some verbiage to 95-15.4 that incorporates the Board of Finance's auspices and says that something along the lines of at its first regularly scheduled meeting in January once every other year perhaps the representative town meeting shall convince shall convene a special committee to review article 3 of chapter 95 tax relief for elderly and disabled homeowners and uh, a yearly review with the I was going to say Ross Murray, but I, I don't think you could name him personally. I think you have to say the tax assessor um, in a capital planning review meeting with the Board of Finance shall be conducted on a yearly basis. Something along those lines that incorporates both the RTM's responsibility to so here's, here's what to, I think. to start with the ordinance and our the Board of Finance's responsibility to have the budgetary oversight. 
I don't want to. Does that speak, make sense? Well, I don't want to. Here's what I want to do. I want to follow the opinion of the town attorney and leave it at that. It, I don't think he thinks the RTM has a role, except they vote on the number. That, but, but, but. We, we, that's, not, that's not his opinion. That's not the current. I don't know what, what Mr. Baldwin's opinion because he hasn't. I've not seen anything. Let's get an opinion. So I can I can reach out. I can reach that out to Mr. Lester's opinion, but those two have different opinions, so we need to get Mr. Baldwin's opinion. Then. Okay. Yeah. Before and, we and, vote and on this, I think so. Okay. I, I think we need to. Oh, uh, so yeah, a few. So well, let me just let me just give you two seconds on timing. So if you remember a couple months ago, we pushed through a part of this ordinance because, and that had to do with the disabled portion, right? Uh, that particular language had to be in place at the beginning of the, of the calendar year. So that's done. Um, the, if we can enact these changes before the physical things go out the door, which is June-ish, right? Uh, then we can take advantage of this of of the, the the seniors will be able to take advantage of this now if if we if we delay this we're, we're right on the hairy edge of being able to do it this year and i'm not a fan of of, of coming before any board and saying you got to rush it because but you I, know i i agree with you i think just leave the language alone until we find it. Until but I, but i'm happy to to we can pass this i'll have uh, yeah i'm happy to talk to mr baldwin and 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 have him look at that and maybe make a, a recommendation but i mean like i said the 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 one th one of the things that they both agreed on, Mr. Lesser and Mr. Baldwin, is that we have to start the process. So if the RTM every year wants to start a committee and they say, oh, we found something, and we go, okay, don't care, then nothing happens. I mean, that's the way I interpret this, right? So anyway, so that's it. Thank you for the time. I know it was quite long. Quite long, but very detailed. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. Well, the motion's on the table. Do we have an amendment to this? Are we passing as is? Jim, did you have an amendment you wanted to add? Well, we've, we've amended. Um, I mean, I'll take the action to amend with the language that we've, I think we've interim have amended. Be happy to make Oops, sorry. I'll be happy to make, make those changes in, as the amended stage before it goes to the RTM. And by the way, I guess I'm, if 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 the board is okay, I'll, I'll brief on behalf of the board to the the That's RTM and the okay. LNA. All right, Chris. Can, so I, can I just ask one question? Question on uh, ninety five eleven about the proration. Should we put down what how the proration is to be calculated? I mean, I believe the I believe the calculation should be where you'd get a percentage, that percentage being equal to numerator would be whatever the tax credit you were entitled to pursuant to the, to the statute, and the denominator being the total number, the total amount of all credits <laughs> that everybody was entitled to. So that's budget. The, your numerator is your budget. No. You, then you're, you're no, 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 no. So, the, so the new, the denominator would be the total amount of everybody who who was a successful applicant. Right. Thirteen hundred. We have too people. much money. We yep. have too much money. So you would get your percentage, your individual percentage, and you'd multiply that times the budgeted amount of senior tax relief. So you'd oh, you, yeah. you So you would equal. You'd get your say it was. We were three percent over. Well, you'd get ninety-seven percent of whatever, right? Yes, of what you would have got. I mean, I think that. I mean, if it's the if. How do you if write it's the, that? If it's the budget versus the actual spend, you'd get a percentage, and they just take that percentage. Yeah. You that'd be the haircut everyone would have to take. Yeah. Because then. It seems to be the only justifiable it's really, way to do it. It's really budget divided by the projected. Overage or projected budget. So if you go over, so if the budget's a million dollars, maybe and you maybe say maybe, over maybe that's a simple way to do it. That's much easier. That's you know. Yeah. That number. That number's going to be. Yeah. That, I guess that's the ninety-seven percent, and then you know 
subtract that from one, that's the amount of, of yeah. Of, so of that's reduction. a simpler right. that's a simpler way to do it. So again, I'm an engineer. So it helps me in this regard, not the English part. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, Chris. So are we are we going to detail that, or or are we going to just let it stand? I think it needs detail because, I mean, how how is this to be interpreted? I, I'm with you, Jim. I think it needs to be detailed. I, yes. I just it, it, problematic. It, it, it begs for confusion. It's been a long day. I wouldn't even know yeah. how to write that yep. at this point in time. I, I know I the, I follow the conversation, but it's going to take a paragraph just to write that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and so this may have no, to I come mean, back. It's it's, it's it, it literally is it's budget as the numerator divided by the projected projected budget because that number is going to be bigger and, that, and then it's it's one minus that that's the amount one, I think one I th because the number is going to be 90 set the number is going to be point point zero nine seven or, or no the number is going to be point nine seven and then if you want to know how much everyone has to be prorated you subtract that number from one which is the whole Everyone at, at, at the budget, everybody gets 100%. If you go over the budget, 3%, it's 97, that math comes out to 97%. One minus that number gives everybody a 3% reduction. If, if, you're, if, you're, if, if, if you're happy, I can, I'd be happy to write and put something out for review or whatever I mean I do want to vote this budget I do want to vote this forward but. all right what happens look what we've been all over the place now and we've changed this thing up Jim has a bunch of notes no, that was, I was trying no, to I write, I was trying to you have the language, notes I'm not a hundred percent sure we know exactly what we're voting on at this point Here's what I think we're voting on. The document that's in front of you as amended, as amended with, the change, with the change in the audit amounts, right? We changed the, um, we removed the 2.5% cap because that's no, you know, that's, we don't need a cap. We're, we're just saying we have to spend within the budget. Um, the, the current conversation is that um, we are going to define what prorated means, and everything else is as in this document. Yeah, I, I, I think at this point. So, Chris, could you send us language just to look at sooner than later? I know we can vote on this tonight, but or maybe a semblance of that language. Yep. Just so that we're uh, comfortable. It's going to be a sentence. Are you talking about the proration? Yeah. We can't vote on it tonight if we don't have that language. We don't have an ordinance before us. That, that won't be part of the ordinance. Do you want to, do you want to take a stab at it? That's what I'm Just saying. Just get it Can off the table? Can we take a stab at a sentence? I mean, we're here. I, I mean. Yeah. I, it, it would be a formula. The, um, if you add it to the end of that 9-11, um, the proration formula, the proration formula for the amount of decrease each individual participant would have would be one minus, in parentheses, budget over projected budget, parentheses. I don't have a whiteboard, I can't show you. It's gotta be a formula. I was gonna do prorate. Yeah, you'd have to say that it's a percentage, the numerator of which the numerator of which is the um, you take the budget. budgeted amount divided by um, 
the denominator being I know that's why I'm like this is going to take a little bit you take the budget and divide it by what? the projected budget or whatever you want to call it you take that one yes that's divided by nine. where'd you go to school in my Chris, Chris, when, when, if we brought this back at our first meeting in April, can can we just fix, clean this up, and bring it back? What's the What's the problem with doing that and uh, having it voted on in April? That the RTM would have it in April, they would have it at the end of April, and then they would have it in May, correct? The problem is I was going to brief the board of selectmen. They meet twice in April, right? No, I know. I know Chris I'll wants go, to, to vote one, on I'll, this, I'll but this done, so I'm the one I know you want it done, <laughs> but now we're starting to take out napkins and and, and write on. Yeah, napkins. no. I mean, I have yeah, no problem. No, my goal in pushing this forward tonight I, was I to try and enable it to get to the five committee. Days. But I mean, if I could probably have it to you in two days. Right. I mean, um, if we wanted to try to either get a special meeting or to vote on an early April. Do we have an early April meeting? Well, we, yes, because when we vote Is on the Is that going to work, rate. Chris, from an RTM standpoint? We don't vote on the mill rate. That's the issue, because May they no. need no. LNA for two months. I was, we have a final I was hoping to get this right? to the LNA in yes. March. So my other, only other question is, if we don't add that language, but make, uh, provide some recommended language to the RTM LNA to consider, they could add it in, right? I mean, with the understand, our understand, we could say we would like language on proration in here to make okay. so that there's no confusion. And no, then you, you're, right. The other, you're right, Sheila. Language. We've already protected ourselves right. by instituting the cap. We'll, we'll, right. We'll, we'll write. Now that the, the, the manner in proration, we have a preference as to how we like to see it done. But they have. They're going to be the final arbiters of the language, so why not? And and, and let's let's you take, can take one, that, let's Ruth. take one big step back. This is the language. This language is in the ordinance today with the proration, right? It's not quantified for the last. This went into effect in 1985 or something like that, and no one has felt the need to prorate. Pro, sorry, define the proration. So I think if you ever had to prorate, you, the tax assessor has to figure out how to do that. And what you're <laughs> saying is a logical way to do it. I don't think it needs to be in there. <laughs> Mr. Flynn. made a similar comment at the Board of Selectmen meeting, I know, um, on another topic the other day, uh, as opposed to doing it here, uh, you can actually call for a, a meeting just on this topic, maybe right before one of your budget hearings next week, and spend a half hour and just be very comfortable with the language, and then forward it along to the RTM. I and as, do it, so as for know. the Board of Selectmen, yeah. um, we don't vote on this. so. So you can do a presentation, but I think it's more important that it get in front of the RTM. So next well, week, if you our meet first, at 7. Our first meeting is Monday. I suggest yeah. we meet at 7 o'clock and have this wrapped up by 7.30 on Monday. I think Thank you, Mr. I'm, Chairman. I'm much more comfortable with that. Um, I will... I will get to our chairman. Thanks for making my next I'll, Monday I'll longer than it was, Mr. Flynn. I'll make Flynn. the changes, all of the changes. Yes. All at um, once, all written out, so we can look at it. You can look at it, and you'll distribute it to the body beforehand, right? Yes. Yes. And it's not that many. Sure. Things. So we'll get it to. Uh, sure. We'll get it to Jennifer Carpenter for backup for okay. us. Okay. The only Sheila, thing I'm this, this won't end. <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah, that, and that's my, right, we're going to meet one more time, by the way, just so we're all clear. We're going to have a lessons learned from this thing. We're going to put together, we're going to put together something to give right. to the next group of people okay. who are going to take okay, this so on we'll, in their we'll team. 95-15-4, we're not changing anything? I mean, I think we need, okay. <laughs> I don't know why they would. 
And also, can we? Get well, you, 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 because th you think we sh they should meet every single year on this? That's up to them. It, it, it's, it, it is. It's up to them. <coughs> they write this ordinance. If they want to take that out, but the, I mean, let's be clear. You know, and I'll a and I'll ask Mr. Baldwin for his opinion. Maybe it'll change their mind. But if they want to change that language that you are, Tim, go for it. But if they want to meet every year, and they come to us every year and say, "Hey, I think we should change it," and we say no, then we don't change it. It doesn't get changed. Maybe that's something you guys could discuss and get it back to us for Monday, and maybe speak to Mr. Baldwin too and get his opinion. I, I will take that All action right. as well. Okay, so we're moving this to a date forward. Monday, we'll talk the meeting. We we'll have a we special need... meeting Monday at seven o'clock. Wherever we're going to meet, right now is scheduled for Osborne Hill at seven thirty. Oh yeah. Do we have to add it to the? Do we have to add table this and add this to the agenda and all that stuff? No, for it'll be a special meeting, so it'll be the only oh. thing on the agenda. Well, I, yes. I, so do we have to make a motion to postpone? Uh, we'll <laughs> sit as far apart as we need to, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I, I want a six, I want six, I want six feet radius. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, we have to table it. So, so we're going we're gonna to vote to table this to Monday the 16th. So Mr. Testani, Mr. DeWitt reluctantly seconds. I do? Yes. I was going to vote against it. Okay, I'll second. <laughs> All right, Mr. Walsh will second. All those I'll in second. favor, table some Monday. Opposed. Okay, Mr. DeWitt opposes. I want to go on a ride. So, so, Mr. Brown, my only question is, and it's not related to this as much as we have these scheduled meetings. We don't know what's happening in terms of how we're going to have those meetings, correct? There's no, is there any uh, guidance point, from actually. the town? That's a great yeah, point. Is Wait. there guidance from the town in terms of how the boards are going to meet, how we're going to get through these? Because I'm, I mean, virtually, well, this do is, we have any? at the beginning of the meeting? I was here, but I'm like, I'm just, I want to make sure that we meet. Now I'm concerned that we <laughs> we're not going to vote on this ordinance, no. and I want we're, to get we're a gonna, vote. We're going to, I'll, I'll turn over to Mr. Bremer, but we're going to meet. We don't know where, we don't know how, but we're going to meet how it's going to work, okay? Mr. Bremer, have you ordered us individual ventilators? <laughs> I, I prefer... <laughs> Look, I was thinking of grenades myself. Listen, let me tell you what I prefer, and I said, is to... Is to we meet as a body and we figure out how we want to do, we want to bring in the, um, the department heads, how we're going to handle that and, and the public. Right now we're not sure. Everything's changing almost on a daily basis. Uh, I can tell you I'm 98% sure that you won't be meeting in any school facility on Monday. My suspicion, my strong hunches will not be meeting on any school facility. My strong hunches, they don't want anybody who doesn't attend the school to be in the school, and I wouldn't be surprised if the schools are closed on Monday, but that's more speculation than I know anything. Um, I, I do know there's a half a day on Friday and they're gonna be cleaning or something. I would not be surprised if they use that at, to be done uh, and close the schools thereafter. Uh, but that is speculation. Uh, but everything's changing on a daily basis. So I'm 90% sure you won't be meeting in any school we're setting up really two rooms. The, uh, the, the, on the first floor of the main Independence Hall, that's this, the, where the uh, Board of Selectmen meet. We're gonna use that room. And we may be using this room as well. So it's one of those two rooms. And uh, according to the email that went out today, uh, I've noticed and seen on, on the town website that most meetings have already been canceled today, tomorrow, that sort of thing. They're canceling March and April's meetings. Now, how that affects you, that's a whole other scenario, and how it affects the RTM is a whole other scenario. So we're, we're, we're going back and forth on how we're gonna deal with that. We're talking about telephonic, we're talking about maybe set, setting up video conferencing. I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna do it or what we're gonna do. But everything may change tomorrow, but that's as best as I can tell you right now tonight. Okay. Yeah, Jim, I, I don't want to rain on everybody's parade, but I mean, I've had these dates in my calendar. You know, a, a lot of time and planning went into my household to arrange all these nights. I, I mean, I urge everyone. I, I mean, we've we've got deadlines by charter that we have to meet. 
I mean, this. I'm, I'm well aware. <laughs> okay. I mean, I just do don't. I, I don't want to be held accountable for the fact that, that this stuff gets pushed into April, oh. and we're doing mass media. You know, every this is. The, the, the I'm employed. It's not going to be any better in April. Yeah. You're Ed. absolutely right. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and and you're, you're absolutely right. So look, the way, the way I would understand it is, we're meeting. It's how the department, how we're going to communicate with the department heads and how we're going to communicate with the public is what is needs to be figured out. But the Board of Finance intends to keep our dates. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Subject to state law. And, and just so when, so when the Board of Finance intends to keep our dates I understand. Okay, unless something <laughs> comes down and says that we cannot. I understand. From Hartford. I got right. you. So we'll, but that, that's where we're at right now. No problem. Okay. I, I, I fully agree. But I do understand we need to take precautions and take the sure. necessary steps to sure. make sure everybody is comfortable and safe. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Bremer on that subject? So you'll let us know, Mr. Brown. I, did, I, I communicated. I communicated with the first select woman. I'll know latest Friday, hopefully tomorrow. And if, I, I talked to Mr. If anything Baldwin changes, too. if anything changes, well, it's going to change. Something's going to change. Well, as it changes, you'll get the phone call. Yeah, as it changes. Right. And then I will immediately would immediately communicate it back to the board of finance. Okay. Just be prepared to get more than one update. I would just say, for all we know, there could have been someone in this room tonight that is diagnosed, which would mean that we cannot meet again. So I think having a plan B to meet by video conference so that we're not scrambling to do that at the last second would be probably the prudent thing to do, because that's what's happening. I mean, I think you all probably heard Westport canceled their public budget hearings I mean this is what happens you get one person and then everyone you come in contact with it's over so might not be bad to just figure out the plan B I mean whether it's a zoom conference you know, we don't have to do it we can meet if we can but um, scrambling at the last second might be difficult they're, they're looking at that tomorrow that's that's everything that they're looking at mr. Matola the only thing I would say I'm sorry to be a pain in the neck I Meeting in the first floor conference room of Independence Hall, that, that, that room is, I love all you guys, I, it's too tight. I, I don't want to be sitting on top of each other. I think this room, if we're going to meet in here, should be arranged a little differently so we have more space between us. Uh, I mean. Okay. I agree. Look, we've had meetings. I, I got it. That's all I'm going to say. All right. We've had meetings there as the Board of Finance. It is a tight, it, it's pretty tight, but. But we, we'll update everybody. Want my hands in, okay. Any other questions? This was going to be a fairly easy night, and uh, it was ev everything but that. All right, so let's see if we can get through the minutes. Okay, and we're going to have to vote. Thank you, Mr. Bremer. We're going to vote. Have to vote on each. Uh, each one of these minutes separately because remember take a look you aren't all here for some okay so we'll start with to hear and approve minutes from November 19th 2019 November 26 2019 December 3rd 2019 December 16th then January 7th 2020 and February 5th 2020 so let's go to November 19th 2019 can I have a motion to put this one on the table? Mr. Matola, a second. Mr. DeWitt, all those in favor? Opposed, abstain? Okay, we have six and three. Uh, November 26th, minutes of the Board of Finance quarterly review meeting. Can I have a motion to put this one on the table? Mrs. LeClaire, second by Mr. DeWitt. All those in favor? Opposed abstentions should be two. Yes, and Mr. Bateson. Okay, six three. 
Minutes of the Board of Finance, regular monthly meeting, December 3rd, 2019. Can I have a motion, please, Mr. LeClaire? Second by Mr. Walsh. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. M Minutes of the Board of Finance special meeting, December 16th, 2019. Can I have a motion? Mr. Matola, second by Mr. DeWitt. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? One. Mr. Walsh. Board of Finance meeting minutes, January 7th, 2020. Mr. DeWitt, seconded by Mrs. Charlton. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Regular meeting, Board of Finance uh, minutes from February 5th, 2020. Mr. Testani, seconded by Mrs. LeClaire. All those in favor? Opposed? Done. Okay. Nice. To hear, consider, and act upon any communications, Mrs. Bossi, do you have any for us? I'm surprised. Okay. Noble effort. Item number seven, this is to adjourn. Can I have a motion, Mr. Matos and my Mr. Walsh, all those in favor? All right, very good. Thank you, everybody.